Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. We've got a very interesting guest today. Actually, uh, I may not be doing this if it wasn't for the work of the guy we have on today, Michael Bain. And before we just started recording, he was talking about some of the other work that he's done. Uh, you've been writing about music, travel, and the out of doors, guns, and icons like Hank Williams Jr. Did you also have something to do with uh, a Willie Nelson autobiography? I, I, I did. On a biography of Willie, uh, I was desperately in need of money, and, and a company came to me and said, can you write about Willie? And I called Willie, and Willie said, yeah, sure, I'm happy to do it. Um, and he goes, where do you think it's important to interview me? And I said, at your house in Maui? And he goes, <laughs> right. <laughs> So he literally <laughs> called up the publisher and said, I'm willing to talk to Mr. Bain, but it has to be at my house in Maui. And I'm like, thanks, brother. Um, nice. Can I tell you a so, quick Willie Nelson story? Of course. Just quick. Just quick. Um, I'm in New York City. I'm a rock critic. I'm the editor of Country Music Magazine. I know the four most important words in the English language, which are, I'm with the band. Uh, but we're, we can't get access to rock acts anymore because they're starting to figure this out. So I went to North Carolina. 76 75 knocked on the door of willie nelson's bus and he opens the door and i'm standing there and i said hi i'm a rock critic from new york and i'd like to go on the road with you and he goes huh you got a bag I said yeah sure so uh, me and willie nelson tommy lee jones and chris christopherson did the state fair circuit across the south awesome. and and the thing is is once you're on the bus you must be somebody because you're on the bus but one night the, the road manager goes he goes i I don't suppose, Bain, if I said the words 1911, that you would know what I was talking about? I said, well, as it happens, I do. He goes, prove it. Opens his briefcase, 1911A1. I empty it, take it apart, put it back together, set it down, and he goes, son of a gun. Load that sucker up and let's go get the gate. And so my job was to stuff a gun in my pants and come back with a grocery sack of cash. No. Uh, it was, those were old days and it was all rock and roll and i think the statute of limitations has run out awesome that's hilarious so most people i would say my age and younger i'm i was born in the late 70s the area you're talking area you're talking about would know you from the outdoor channel shows mm -hmm. right yep and that's uh um uh, you know before that at at I always wanted to write. I mean, I was kind of born to write, and I went to New York City as, as a writer. And, of course, during the time I went to New York City, uh, it, it was rock and roll times. You know, it was all CBGBs and, and uh, you know, 4 a.m. second shows, all those kind of happy things. And um, I fell in with really, really great music writers, legendary uh, Nikki Tosh's uh, Lester Bangs, hmm. maybe the greatest music critic that's ever lived. And, and these guys sort of towed me along. Um, uh, my, first, my first week in New York City, I was staying with my friend John Morthland, who had been the editor of Cream Magazine, oh, wow. and did the uh, first interview with Mick Jagger for Rolling Stone. And I was camped out on his couch, and, and one day he says, we're going to a second show to see, uh, you know, I don't, somebody you never heard of, Elvis Costello. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, cool. <laughs> so we go see Elvis Costello. It's the middle of the night, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and Lester shows up. And Lester goes, who the hell are you? And John goes, he's Michael. He's with us. And Lester goes, come with me. We go to a Lower East Side bar, and it's um, a dive would be kind. Uh, there were people dancing on the bars, all sorts of weird things going on. Um, and, and Lester walked in, and people started applauding because Lester by then was a star. And there was one other music critic guy who was actually passed out on the bar. And his head is in the bar in a pool, a beer. And Lester grabs him by his hair and pulls his head up, throws a beer in his face. The guy looks at Lester and says, someday a real rain's going to come and wash this scum off the streets. And that was kind of my introduction to New York music rock and roll. And uh, uh, we all kept going until it became obvious that it would kill all of us if we mm. stayed. Too much fun. Yeah, way too much fun. But, you know, I did that, and it, it's um, – as a writer, I moved out, you know, so, uh, after Lester's death, a lot of us scattered out of New York. And I was just sitting in my house in Florida, and I got a call from one of my old music editors, and he goes, I got an assignment, dude, if you want to take it. 
And I said, at this point, I would take an assignment writing a dog food commercial, man. I'm, I'm kind of out of money. And he goes, I need you to go to Texas and interview some old broad. I said, do you have an old broad in mind, or can I just pick one off the street? I mean, what's the deal? And he goes, some old philosopher broad named Ann Rand. I said, no way. You're asking me to interview Ayn Rand, the foremost philosopher of my generation? He goes, so you heard of the old broad? I said, yeah, I read the books. So I went to Texas. And, no uh, and it's Ayn Rand, not, not too long before she died. But I go in this room. There's, there's a folding chair and a high stool. And I sit in the folding chair, and Miss Rand comes in. She's small, and she gets on this high stool. And she's looking down at me, and i got two tape recorders and notebook and all that happy stuff. And I, I'm ready, she goes, I'm ready. And so I asked her a question, and she didn't answer. She sat there for a minute, and she goes, that's not good enough, young man. Try again. And I'm like, I'm going to die here. But I ended up having like a four-hour conversation with Ayn Rand. I'm in a far were your, range. Were your questions, were they too uh, cliche for her? Did she want something a little more deep and meaningful? Yes. Yeah. You know, you start out with what amounts to newspaper questions. So how did you get to be a writer? What first started you thinking about that? Um, I, I didn't want to get a real Not job. You, it was you asking her. I, I, I asked her. She said that there were things she had to say. And that those things were important. And that the way to reach popular culture, the only way she knew to reach popular culture, was through her fiction. And, and she's right. She's right. And, and then we, we ended up talking a lot about greed. Because, I mean, I, I think that's a, a misunderstand part, misunderstood part of Randism. You know, the, the, I, I guess you would, you would call it like, uh, what was her line? You know, if... if if you don't have any self-love, you can't understand love with another person. I agree with uh, that. And, and, and that is absolutely true. And the same thing is, is that, that when you, if you are striving for yourself and that in turn drives the public good, that's great. Mm -hmm. If you're striving for yourself against the public, well, that's not very good. Uh, if you're doing something altruistic, you're Satan. You know, any, anybody who says they're doing it for your own good or you're doing it for the culture, you're doing it for society, you're not really doing it for any of those things. It's an act of self-aggrandizement. And so she and I kind of went round and round with that a good bit. I mean, she's um, mm. one of the smartest people I've ever talked to, you know, kind of right on up there with the, the computer tech oligarchs. But uh, funny, the funny story is that, it's, it's that when we got done, she just stopped. She goes, I'm done, Mr. Bain. I said, okay, Miss Rand, thank you. And she gets off her stool, and she heads down the hallway. She gets all the way to the end of the hallway. She comes back, turns around, comes back, gets right in my face. And she goes, Mr. Bain, young man, you have one thing to do with your life, one single thing to do with your life. See clearly. See clearly. That's the only thing you have to do with your life. Thank you and goodbye. And I consider that the best single piece of advice I ever got. She's correct. See I, clearly. I like it. Um, it, I like it, it. But that ran. I, I did a bunch of stuff. Uh, the Chicago Tribune News Syndicate brought me in at the beginning of the computer revelation, revolution. I got to spend time at MIT with Nicholas Negroponte, uh, people like David Packard of Hewlett Packard, Andrew Grove of Intel. Um, what some you, of the what were you doing with them? Uh, hanging out, writing articles. Um, I, 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 I think, I, I, think I, I dredged up some stuff you wrote about IBM and different computer stuff. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I was hired by the Chicago Tribune News Syndicate um, because I could translate computer into English. I, could I, I was trained as an engineer in college, but dropped out for all the reasons I said. And um, I, I liked talking to those people, and I got along well with them, and I spoke the language. And so mm -hmm. at that time, it was all new. It was all magic and new. It was all like, wow, these computers and... I remember when I met Nicholas Negroponte at, at the MIT Media Lab, I went in and sat down in his office, and uh, I'd read his columns in Wired Magazine, and essentially looking into the future, and I sat down, and he goes, his first words, not even hello, he goes, how much do you know? I said, well, I know a lot about computers, and I start talking, and he goes, stop, you know nothing at all, nothing. He goes, let's start with zero. I'm like, okay, what's zero? And he goes... In 20 years, you'll even have computer in your underpants. Everything will be chipped. I said, are you sure? And he goes, let's not even address that. Just assume I'm correct. And, of course, <laughs> here we are. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is chipped. He was The MIT Media Lab is the future 
or what you know they they, they had a window on the future um but that was you know that was um it was fun you know the odd thing is 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 uh, through the whole thing i kept shooting uh, that was something I, I started when i was a kid um even in New York City, I, I tried to get a New York City uh, permit to possess a pistol. And after like nine or ten months, I went to the basement of one police plaza, you know, with all my paperwork and with a certified check and all that happy stuff. And I, I go in and there's in the basement, there's one cop, one desk, one light and a chair. And I sat in the chair in front of the cop and he looks at my paper and he goes, your paper's in order. And, every, and it really cost me a lot. You had to get a lawyer. And he goes, now... Did you bring the $500 unofficial cash tax? No way. I said, excuse me? And he goes, there's a $500 cash tax, and we don't give effing receipts. Nice. I said, sir, I don't have $500. He takes all my paper, throws it in the garbage cans, goes, get the hell out of here. And I'm like, okay, Mr. Naive. <laughs> Another day. Uh, that, that, that was a pretty normal occurrence back at one point in history. It was. Um, in fact, all of uh, firearms licensing in New York City was eventually put in the hands of internal affairs. I wonder why that was. Mm. But there's always, uh, I went to, I stayed at a friend's house in the apartment in New York City. This is like, I don't know, late 70s, early 80s. And I walk in and he goes, hey, you want to buy a J-frame? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm always up for a J-frame. Cheap. And he goes, 100 bucks, $100. Give me a bill. And I said, sure, I'll do it. Sight unseen, I take $100 to the J. And, and he goes into his bedroom, and he comes back in, and he pitches a sack toward me. And I'm looking at the sack in the air, and I step back and let it hit the ground. And I have my hands up, and he goes, what's the problem, Michael? I said, that's a sealed New York City Police Department evidence bag, and stapled to it is a chain of custody. And he goes, well, the guy that <laughs> sold it to me, uh, he's a policeman. He said it was good. I said, I'm not going to touch it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it is a closed evidence bag. The chain of custody is attached to it. Brother, that walked out of, of the warehouse. And he goes, could I be in trouble? I said, I think you should visit the East River. Yeah, and make it goes, go away. And I said, he goes, I'm going to call my friend. I said, just throw the damn thing in the deep. Um, you don't want to get mixed up in internal NYPD politics. And thankfully, I mean, you know, that was pretty much the Serpico time. There was a lot of cleaning up that went on in, in New York City at that time. A lot, a, lot, a lot has changed, not only in government, but the transparency. We've got FOIA now, freedom of information, so much that people never knew existed. I live out in the country. And we've got a small community near me. A couple years ago, one of the... Uh, the mayor got caught running cocaine out of the mayor's office, a small <laughs> farm community. And one of like the three or four police officers on, on staff there, this tiny town, not my town, but one near me, this guy was going door to door in the neighborhoods collecting unused pharmaceuticals from old people. He was, <laughs> an, he was an opioid junkie. So when they came and raided his house, they found all kinds of stuff that was from the evidence locker at the little PD that he had helped himself to over the years, guns, knives, electronics, stuff confiscated off the street and still happens. But now this guy's in prison back in the day. Nobody would have done a thing about it. And, that. and, and that's good. I mean, that, that we used to laugh in New York city that the only, only law in New York city that you could actually have a policeman come out for was assaulting a policeman. You know, any like oh, my friend got her car stolen. She said, "Can you come out and fill out a report?" And the guy goes, "It's a stolen car, lady. Forget it." Hmm. And she goes, "I got to have a report for my insurance company." He said, "Come down here. We'll sign a form for you." She's like, "Well, okay." Um, but it's. I'm glad it's changed. You know, I'm, I'm glad it's changed for um, sure. Um, That's interesting. You you say that, and you've you've lived uh, uh, through enough of this stuff. It's comical to me when I see. So one of the things I do, I'm involved in in gun legislation uh, from a lobbying and education standpoint, and I'll see younger people that uh, guys like forty and younger don't understand that twenty years ago there wasn't all these concealed carry laws across the country. That it's a new thing, or you'll hear guys talking about the good old days when everything was. <laughs> Like, you know, some wonderful pie in the sky. And I think, are you f nuts? Like, do you not have any comprehension of not just U.S. history, but world history? 
I mean, that's amazing to me, too. I mean, it, I was in Florida in the 80s, and uh, um, I was lucky enough to fall in with Colonel Cooper uh, into okay. the 1970s. And uh, what do you so, mean by fall in with him? Um, I just, I'd, I'd realized I'd been shooting bullseye out on Long Island, and I realized that, that you know, I, I kept reading Colonel Cooper's articles in um, mm -hmm. uh, Guns and Ammo, and, and I thought, these are the guys I really want to start to meet to understand what they're doing. I think the first one I met was like uh, uh, Ken Hackathorn, Kenny Hackathorn, still one of my best friends. And through Kenny and uh, um, those guys, you know, they'd say, you know, you need to meet Colonel Cooper. And I, eventually, Mike Dillon, who founded, of course, Dillon uh, Reloading, yeah. uh, he introduced me to Colonel Cooper. And um, it was funny. It was at a restaurant and, and really in the middle of the night somewhere. And Colonel Cooper was having dinner with a group of people. And Mike Dillon took me over. And he goes, um, um, Jeff Cooper, I would like to introduce you to Michael Bain. And Colonel Cooper looked at me. And he, he does this. He goes, like, hmm, hmm. And he goes, Michael Bain. He goes, not every word you write is complete dreck. I said, Thank you, Colonel. That's a really big honor. <laughs> and he goes, and I had a long hair and a ponytail. And he goes, and cut your hair, man, for God's sake. Show some pride. I'm like, okay, Colonel, whatever you say. But um, I, I started to begin following those guys and, and got kind of sucked into what we think of, I think of as a USPSA vortex. Uh, I was one of the people at the first meeting that founded USPSA, you know, the American arm of IPSC. Uh, that meeting was held at the Dollhouse in Orlando, and the Dollhouse is exactly what you might think it was. Um, we were, as a group, so poor, the strippers bought us beer. But nice. we, sat, we sat in there for like eight or ten hours with yellow pads, and we essentially created USPSA. Uh, this is roughly how it's going to work. And, oh, yeah, we're going to create standardized training for range officers, and we're going to standardize everything. That was all. Um, a, how many guys were in that meeting? I think seven. Myself, uh, Dave Arnold from from Virginia, who's who's gone now. Tommy Campbell, who was in research and development at Smith and Wesson. Walt Roush, uh, the late Walt Roush, uh, former Secret Service, uh, Philadelphia Felony Squad, uh, tough private dick on the docks of Philadelphia, one of the toughest man I've ever met, and a man who became my mentor. Uh, Jake Jatris, who was editor of a publication called Combat Shooters Report, and a guy named Dave Chirillo who would literally Dave Chirillo thought up the idea of the national range officer Institute. Cool. He said, if we created a school and we trained everybody the same, then think of it. You go to a match in Florida and a match in California and a match overseas. And it's the same rules, same standards, same targets, same. And at that time there was nothing like that. Nothing. Yeah. Um, and, and we, you know, we all thought it was pretty much a pipe dream. And, and the amazing thing to me is it, is it got pulled off over the years. Um, it worked. But this, you know, ongoing from there, we were shooting competition, and that was the first time any of us had really used holsters because there was no concealed carry. Right. I mean, it was yeah. against the law. You yeah. couldn't do it. Um, I mean, I remember carrying a gun occasionally when I was a kid in the woods, and it was like, a, ooh, ooh, we're in the woods with a gun. But um, w when we started that battle in Florida, where we said, okay, well, now we're going to go to the state and we're going to get concealed carry. We're all like, it's never going to happen. But we lobbied and, you know, we did all that. And, and all of a sudden it passed. And it was kind of interesting um, because it became for us, you know, those of us in the competition community, because we, we probably had a larger skill base than anybody else at that point, was uh, what do we do now? Hmm. So I, I worked with one other guy, a friend of mine that I shot with, and, and we created the first uh, Florida acceptable course in concealed carry. And, um, you know, now I look back on that and that, that's amazing. You know, it's, it, that was like what, 86, mid eighties or yeah. I forget that when that battle actually took place, but, um, it was something we talked about, you know, we would compete and we would go to compete. We put on a holster, we put the gun in the holster, and then we would very carefully have to take the gun out of the holster, pack everything up when we left. Yeah, yeah. And we would talk about like, well, this is nonsense, you Playing know, but, uh, um, a lot, of, a lot of younger people don't realize that, that what a huge success that battle was, the concealed yeah. carry battle. Um, I look at that, those kinds of stories, the, the, the concealed carry battle. Like We were the last state here in Illinois to finally pass a law. Um, we had great cases like McDonald versus City of Chicago, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court battle that, that came out of our, of our state here. But like what you're talking about, uh, or even the USPSA, 
it's very much like what happened in the 1770s in the America yeah. with the colonies. A small group of people got together. Starting USPSA is not the same as is declaring freedom from Britain, but it's a group of people putting their mind together to to achieve a common goal. And most people at the time think you're f-ing nuts, whatever. But then the fruit of the la- of all that labor eventually is ripe and ready to do something. It's cool. I remember uh, state legislatures saying to me, asking me, like, you're not saying that you really want to carry a gun all the time. Like, uh, yeah, kind of that's, that is what we're saying. <laughs> and, and, and they would look at us and go like, why? What are you afraid of? I'm like, I'm not afraid of anything. I also own a fire extinguisher. doesn't mean I'm afraid of fire. And they would go, but a gun all the time. And yeah, and yeah. and it, it it was breaking through a wall of them. Like, how how could you guys want to do that? Or especially the women. They they say to women, you know, who it was you know, such a, a societal know. norm that it, a gun was not something you carried. Yeah, it's something that was involved in law enforcement and military and and weird guys who shot stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and and mm-hmm. most people and and maybe still when people think of of competition, they see a bullseye and they see Brian Zinn standing there perfectly formed. Sure shooting perfect little groups um but but it was a fight and the interesting thing was is we kind of went from there to uh police training because a lot of the guys we shot with were law enforcement and at that point they were still using what you think of as the old uh, fbi qualifier course Mm -hmm. you know stand stand there and shoot at target and and um so some of the the law enforcement guys who who we shot with said we need you to come work with us in terms of revamping law enforcement training. And, and we did, I mean, we, you know, essentially we would go and demo and say, this is what we're doing. This is what you're doing. Look at that. Look at us. Look at you. This is, you know, better. And I I did one, I I, I worked as a range master for one of the big uh, departments in, in Florida. And they, uh, my friend called me up and he goes, he goes, I need you to come in and be range master for two days. What for? He goes, we're qualifying everybody. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the first time you're qualifying them on a run and gun course rather than a straight up target shooting. He goes, yeah. I said, why do you want me as range master? I said, he goes, because you're going to flunk people out. And when you flunk them out, they're off the street. And he goes, they're going to be really, really angry. And I would rather be them be really, really angry at you than one of my training officers. And um, I, I ran the first detective I ran, you know, a little J-frame, you know. And um, I said, you know, explain the whole thing when the buzzer starts. It's just like kind of like an Ipsy course. You're going to move down range. You're going to engage these targets as they become visible. And I said, once the buzzer starts, that's it. You know, you got to do with whatever you got on your person. He goes, I understand. Go ahead. And uh, the buzzer went off. And um, he goes, he pulls out his gun. He goes, clickety, 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 click, 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 click. And he raises his hand. <laughs> and I said, sir, keep shooting. And he goes, the gun's empty. I said, reload it. And he goes, I don't have any reloads. I said, find some. And he goes, are you not hearing me? The gun is empty. I raise my hand. I have an alibi. And I'm like, you fail. I'm sorry. And uh, he spoke blue words. And my friend who ran the department, he goes, man, you better not ever get stopped by a traffic ticket here. You're going to do time. These guys hate you. <laughs> but, uh, if it saved fun. their lives in the end, that's a good thing. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's something else that you just brought up. I, I am constantly reminding young dudes about this stuff. We've got this explosion. You in part to the work you did with your, your TV programs where we've you can open up YouTube now and learn how to shoot any gun under the sun by great shooters. And that didn't always exist. I, I, I started learning from guys like Masai Yub and Bob Housingay and those, those kind of cats. And they were like kind of the, the middle point between Cooper and guys my age and they're your age. And I had to write them a letter or call them if I could find their phone number and ask if I could come to a course and then go get permission uh, basically from my local police department or a judge stating that I wasn't a criminal. Now you can go online and find 500 classes and as long as you have money and a gun, you can show up and learn. But 
what you're talking about, that stuff just didn't exist. There just wasn't like a plethora of people to pass on that information. It's pretty cool how, it, how much it, that's changed. It, it wasn't there. I mean, uh, the, if you think of the first generation of, of, of the first modern generation, which would be like Jeff Cooper and uh, Ray Chapman, uh, Kenny Hackathorn, uh, Walt Roush, Jim Cirillo. Yeah, Jim. Uh, um, Jim also was one of my mentors. Jim kind of go uh, right behind me. Yeah, he, and it was lucky on my part. It was just Jim and uh, Jim and Walt said, "You know, you're with us. You're kind of with us. You know, you." Same thing with like Willie Nelson. You're now on the bus, and and they would spend all this time. Uh, you know, I knew how to competition shoot. You know, I'd started teaching. You know, competition shooting. I I understood how to do that, but but Walt and Jim took me into a world that was very real. Um, Jim and I talked a lot about, and, and I don't mean this to sound stupid, but Jim and I talked a lot about shooting people. And, and uh, because he had, uh, what, 17 gunfights? And it was more than that. There's a long story that's attached to that. But I would talk to him and say, you know, I, I keep reading all this stuff about uh, mental issues afterwards. And, and he, I said, how does this work? And he goes, well, you know, I feel like God put me on this planet for one single thing. And that was to make sure some bad people didn't keep going. And he goes, to the best of my ability, I did that. Uh, I asked him about that first shootout in the bodega where he steps in and, and you know, there's three shooters holding a hostage, da, da, da. And um, I said, did you say anything when you opened that door? <laughs> and you suddenly are this panorama of, of three guys, two shotguns, a pistol, two hostages. He goes, yeah. I said, wait. I said, that's just brilliant. <laughs> he said, I said, wait. Then I shot him all in the head. Uh, <laughs> And, and he said afterwards, he goes, I didn't think through saying wait, but that was the right thing to say because if I said to you, wait, there's kind of a subconscious reaction. Right. Of, what? Okay. Yeah. yeah, what do you need? And, you know, and it bought Jim the time, which was probably somewhere around a second, two seconds, somewhere in there. But um, uh, it, it Some of those hard. stories are unbelievable. They are. And, and I wish, I mean, Jim wrote a book and I always told him, I am a book author. I like 20 books, 20 nonfiction books, one novel. I said, you should let me rewrite your book <laughs> because the stories that I know from you um, are, are just, same thing with like Walt Rausch. Walt Rausch, uh, an incredible career, Army Intelligence. He goes to Secret Service, and this is kind of cool, um, Secret Service Presidential Protection Detail for Richard Nixon. Uh, he ends up sort of bombing that pretty badly. Um, the story goes, and it's Walt's story and Walt's gone, but he told me this numerous times. Um, Richard Nixon loved Walt. And so Richard Nixon came to the White House one day and he goes, Walt, I got a headache. I'm going to take a nap. Don't let anybody in. And Walt said, yes, sir, Mr. President. And uh, a few minutes later, Henry Kissinger comes up and he goes, I need to speak to the president. And Walt says, the president doesn't want to be disturbed. And Henry Kissinger said, you're not hearing me, Walt. I need to speak to the president. And Walt said, the president will not be disturbed. And Henry Kissinger goes, you know who I am, right? Secretary of State, right? And Walt goes, yes, sir, Mr. Secretary, I know who you are. And he goes, I'm going to walk through that door. And he goes, yes, sir, and I'm going to shoot you. And as Walt says, that's how you get to be Asian in charge in Fargo, North Dakota. You know? <laughs> that's uh, hilarious but he goes to, to philadelphia and it's not enough to just become a cop he becomes the high risk warrant service he and his partner are the people who who essentially delivered warrants to people who were, were killers and that this is what the marshals and big city swat teams do now with 20 dudes and all kinds of gear that's exactly it. And it would be yeah. him and his buddy in a suit and a tie and half a dozen J-frames. And he goes, eight times out of ten, you knocked on the door and you said, please. And, and it was answered by bullets. We all learned to never stand in front of a door. Um, and then he goes through this whole thing and he retires and he's bored. Only Walt. So he becomes a private eye on the docks in Philadelphia. And, and he's just, you know, he's like a character out of um, a, a Raymond Chandler novel or a Dashiell Hammett novel. He's, uh, he's working these cases. They're incredible cases. Um, I, I, uh, I spoke his eulogy um, at, at his funeral. And uh, what I did is I, I spoke um, at the words of Raymond Chandler. Um, uh, Down these mean streets, a man must go who is himself neither mean nor afraid. And, and I always felt that that very much captured Walt. Uh, 
those are a, a type of lawmen that are gone now. You know, they're, they're a type of lawmen from a different age. Uh, and then Walt introduced me to, what's his name? Uh, the last surviving member of Elliot Ness's Untouchables. No way. We're at a range in Fairfax. The guy had been an Olympic shooter. He's really famous. And Walt comes over and he goes, Walt is in awe. Walt is never in awe. And he goes, you got to come over here and meet this guy. And he's like this little, little guy with his shotgun and gray. He goes, he was the last member of the Untouchables. I said, you're the guy that took down Ma Baker and her kids. He goes, yeah, I did. He goes, yes, sir. That was some kind of shootout, all in machine guns. <laughs> like, and we sat around and talked about like law enforcement, that, that pivotal year, 1934. I said, you got to do this, man. you got to tell me something about, about Elliot Ness that nobody knows. He goes, that little prick was really a son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's from the horse's mouth, you know. Um, That's hilarious. But but you get a chance to have spent time with these people. Um, and and y y y what you learn, it's so much. Because it's like now so much of like, well, we all need reality-based training. These are the guys that wrote the book. Yeah. You know, these are the guys that hammered out how it worked. And they hammered it out under fire. You know, it wasn't like, uh, you know, I studied this for 20 years. And, and uh, um, but it's interesting from there with the, with the show, um, I, I, I bullshitted my way into shooting gallery, right? This is my 20th year for shooting gallery, 20th season. That's my cool. good Congratulations. My good, thank you. My good friend Joe Montaigne says, congratulations, you made it into soap opera territory. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was originally setting up, I was hired as a consultant by Outdoor Channel 20 years ago to set up a show on guns with a magazine another, um, that we remain nameless. I got the whole thing set up. We shot a pilot at, at Clint Smith's place down in Texas, Old Thunder Ranch. And um, the magazine pulled out of the deal at the last minute. Hmm. And, and the, outdoor, the owners of the Outdoor Channel then said, we're not going to do this show. It's Friday afternoon. I'm standing in the office. I said, listen, guys, give me until Monday morning and I will bring you a gun show. And the president of the, of the Outdoor Channel was a really great guy. He goes, really? He goes, Michael, just a question. I said, sure. He goes, do you have any idea how television programs get made? I said, no, man. For all I know, gnomes make them. And he starts <laughs> laughing. And he goes, so uh, this show of yours, you know, who's going to host it? And he goes, I am. And he goes, you ever hosted anything in your life? I said, no. And he goes, Nobody from L.A. would say that. I said, dude, I'm not from L.A. And uh, so I came in Monday morning. I had the duck logo. I had the whole shooting gallery idea. We'd travel around the world. We'd just cover whatever caught my attention. And I get done. The presidents and the vice presidents stand up, and they start applauding. And they go, man, you give great presentation. You just give wicked good presentations. And he goes, you don't have a clue as to what you're doing, do you? I said, not a clue. And he goes, you have four shows. Go hang yourself. And um, that was 20 years ago, 20 years ago, 20, 20 seasons ago. How many episodes in 20 seasons? I've done, was it 13 a year and uh, season night? I'm filming season 20. So 19 times 13. Okay. Uh, plus special episodes. Plus I did 13 years of the best defense, 13. So you're talking like 260 episodes, yeah. give or take of just that one show. Yep. And, you know, how cool is that? I, I thought if I got one season where somebody paid me to shoot guns, that would be the scam of my life. I mean, forget this rock critic crap. You know, <laughs> this was a lot cooler. Um, That's awesome. And because I didn't, and there's a strength in, uh, there's a strength in ignorance, it, that, which sounds stupid. I, I did a book on high-risk sports um, called Over the Edge, and it's the book that kind of tripped off the whole high risk sports thing. Is this, and, is this the book that's about you getting up off the couch and going yeah. and starting to do adventure sports, kayaking and all that kind of stuff? Yep. I, uh, okay. I've been in Florida. I was in Florida and I was, I was you know, mostly working for the, the Tribune news syndicate and I was doing really well. Uh, I was teaching windsurfing at the time cause I was bored and I, there was a 60 mile an hour day and I went out on the 60 mile an hour day and lucky to survive, you know, my hands are all bloody and everything. And I was so excited, adrenaline pumped up. I, I took all my friends out for pizza and we, uh, there, that we drank a little. <laughs> um, and so somewhere around closing time when they had to, had to call taxis for us, uh, somebody said, you know, Michael, you should make a list of shit that can kill you. So what a great idea. I mean, you know, enough beer. That sounds just brilliant. So we did 13 things, the shit that can kill you list. And we get done, and everybody's like, so what are you going to do with the list, dude? 
It's on a cocktail napkin. Said, I'm going to do all 13 things and write a book about it. And everybody laughs and, uh, and you know, they joke and everything. And they go, um, the, the punchline is like seven years, all I had, all the money I had in the world and one marriage later, I finished. Um, and what it, was on the list? Some easy stuff, rock climbing, some stuff that bordered on psychotic, cave diving. Uh, cave diving, deep diving. Um, at the time, I read that the the old uh, Mammoth Mountain Kamikaze Dunhill Mountain Bike Race was the most dangerous athletic event in America, so I put that on there. Um, so you uh, wrote, you did that bike race? Yeah, I, I it was the first scary thing I did, and I did it on a mountain bike I bought out of the classified ads in the Tampa Tribune, which, as you know, is a very mountainous region. <laughs> yeah. I trained by jumping it off seawalls, and I went out to Mammoth, you know, and I get there, and there's all these dudes in, in motocross armor, and I got on two long sleeve t-shirts. That's my concession <laughs> to armor, and, and they put us in the little, you know, the trolley going up a rock face. And our bikes are hanging on it. And I'm the only guy in there in a T-shirt. Everybody else is in there looking like they're going to war. Now, wait a second. You had not gone and practiced in the mountains? You didn't go up to the s nope. some hilly spot? <laughs> I no. <went> cold. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, look, he's sitting there looking at me, and he goes, did you get out here in town to run the course? I said, no, I got in last night. He goes, oh, but you've probably done a lot of downhill. I said, no, no, this is my first downhill. And he looked at me, he goes, where are you from? So I'm from Florida, and he goes, you are f going to die. He goes, what are you thinking? I said, apparently, I'm not thinking at all. And he goes, the first turn is an off-camber turn. And so, you know, as opposed to a bank turn, it's an off-camber turn. Now, does this race, is everybody racing simultaneously, or does everybody go down in your time as It's a time court? trial. They put okay. you in a ski shoot. And then just when you're looking around, it's all blue and beautiful, and there's no trees because you're at the top of the world. They shove your ass out the ski chute. And all of a sudden, you're doing 60 miles an hour, and the first turn is, is off camber. And the guy goes, you've got to stay on the edge. I said, what happens if I miss? He goes, you have roughly eight seconds to learn to fly. <laughs> and I'm like, I got down. I got down. I got through it. Got the, went through the time trap at the bottom, got off the bike, and threw up. And I thought I because really, of a, because of the adrenaline and the fear, just so, fear. blind, yeah. freaking terrifying. Uh, halfway down, I smoked my brakes off. Um, I didn't have any brakes. You know, you were just I, metal on metal, just gone. You know, you could see sparks off the front. <laughs> He's like, okay, here we go, here we go, and it was twisty and trees. And I'm thinking this is great. I, but once there, I, I started thinking I got to train. I mean, this this stuff honestly will kill me. Um, and after that, before you proceeded to the next yeah. endeavor, you thought, okay, whatever it is, I got to train myself up to it. So I, I go up. I, I started. You know, I was getting in better and better shape, and I started doing a little short, you know, stuff. And, and I decided one of the things on the list was the Alcatraz Triathlon, where they take you out to Alcatraz and dump you out in the water, and you swim in and do the rest of the triathlon. And I couldn't swim. I'm an adult afraid of water. Wow. <laughs> so I thought, that's the next one I'll do. So I hired a coach. I hired an 8-year-old, a guy who trains 8- to 10-year-olds. And he came out to the pool, and he goes, like, where's the little man? I said, I'm the little man. And he goes, what, what, what? I said, I, how, how old were you at this point? Gosh, that was like, uh, I was in my 40s, so clearly old enough to okay. know better. Um, I said, I'm afraid of water. And he goes, get in the pool, show me your stroke. And I got in the pool, and he goes, go to the deep end. I get to the deep end. I'm like flailing like a dog. And he goes, good Lord, you can't swim. I said, no, I can't. And he goes, I can teach you to swim. And I said, I'm going to do an event in six weeks. And he goes, well, that's reasonable. What kind of event? I said, the Alcatraz Triathlon. And he goes, how, how long is that swim? A mile and a quarter. Okay. It's and in really it, cold water too, right? In the 40s when I did it the first time. Um, it's The current is brutal. The fog comes in and you can't see. Uh, I learned to swim. and I, I, I went out. I went out to San Fran and I wanted to do a training swim out there. And I had a wetsuit and, and, uh, I swam out of the aquatic basin, which is down, you know, right in the heart of San Francisco, and swam out into the open ocean, and the fog closed in. And I thought, this is great. Um, but the thing, interesting thing, which most people don't realize, or I didn't at the time, is that when in that kind of cold water, it, it screws up the synapses. 
you hmm. know, you're marinating in an ice bath. Yeah. And, and what it feels like is, is as the cold gets to you, it feels like something is bumping you on the bottom, which is really bad when you're in the ocean off San Francisco. Yeah. And you're thinking like, I'm going to die. You're out there flailing like it's a white, it's a white, it's a white. I'm going to die. Yeah. You know, you finally get, I was just destroyed. I finally got back in. I was just horrible. Um, and this is like another, this is like everything is stupid in my life. I got to carry my wetsuit. I'm soaking wet. I'm hiking down through, you know, the, around the Embarcadero in San Francisco. And there's this weird old hippie guy on the sidewalk turning cards, doing fortunes. <laughs> and I walk past and he goes, you stop. And I stopped and he goes, I need to read your fortune. Said I need to go to the hotel, <laughs> and then I need to go to the bar. I need a fortification here, and he goes, "Let me turn the cards for you." And I said, "I don't want. I don't have twenty bucks on me." He goes, "For you, it's free." I said, "Sure, dude." So he turns the cards. He looks at me and he goes, "I have no idea what you're doing, but you need to follow your plan exactly and not vary from it one iota, no matter what." The plan is correct. Do exactly as you plan to do. Change nothing. He goes, that's my free advice. I'm like, okay. I'm good with that. Um, that's wonderful. They took us out. You know, they take you out on the ferry to what they call Sand Beach, Rock Beach on, on, on Alcatraz. Water temperatures in the 40, and you jump off the boat. The last thing they tell you when you jump off the boat and swim to the shore of Alcatraz, they go, you know, this is the worst currents on the west coast the water is brutally cold and they said do not kid yourself the water is patrolled by whites and tiger sharks there are no sand sharks here only the deep water killers they say and those guys eat seals they pick off the slow ones seals look like people in wetsuits have a nice swim and now uh, you're like holy smokes okay you know but uh I ended up bicycling across Death Valley, which is like bicycling in a microwave. I've been uh, there in an air-conditioned car. <laughs> it's so hot on the ground in July that if you're wearing like sneakers with air pads in them, the air pads blew up. Did you have uh, support with you? With I did. Water? Okay. I did. And uh, mostly my, my deal with the support was always, if I'm dying, try to keep me from dying. Um, but otherwise, it's, this is on me. I'm, Mr. Stupid did this, so Mr. Stupid's going to do it. How um, long did it take you to bike across Death Valley? A day and a half. Okay. I so finally you... slept in Antelope Valley. I mean, I, I got a hotel room for two hours because I was just cooked, literally. Yeah. Um, oh, and every time I drank water, I just threw up. You know, you, Serious you know, heat stroke. Yeah, you just sat in the tub, you know, until you could drink enough water to not throw up. I climbed Mount. Uh, oh, I did the I did a sport uh, in Alaska. It's a human powered ultra marathon on the Iditarod Trail in February. Um, it's nippy. Um, they used to have this slogan for the race. It was cowards won't show and the weak will die until say, they kill somebody, and then they had to do away with the slogan. You sign. It's a great liability. It's the best liability release I've ever signed in my life. It says, "I acknowledge that this is the worst weather on the North American continent." I acknowledge that temperatures can reach 60 below. I acknowledge there is no hope of rescue. I acknowledge that I could die. And you sign that in front of a notary, and then you stood in front of a camera and read it aloud. Awesome. <laughs> it was so cool. Um, but, you know, being out in that, I mean, it was just, um, um, I saw 40 blow on the thermometer. Uh, and how far did you have to go? Oh, it was 112 miles. I, I actually washed out after 65 miles. So and you're was, walking. Uh, I was actually on a bicycle. A bicycle. The reason okay. I washed, which I had to cover with duct tape, because if I, if I, if, at that temperature, if it was metal and you touched it, it's like licking that orange juice can. You stick to it. Um, I made them, and you know, I had double wide tires and everything. I made the mistake of not hurrying in the morning, and, and so what happens is the snow feels. When the sun hit them, the, uh, the top ice cracked. So I ended up carrying the bicycle the last 22 miles on my Oh, shoulder. God. And post-holing through. And uh, uh, I did that. I, I climbed Mount McKinley, which was, um, to me, I mean. Uh, That's a big achievement. Uh, and I didn't get to the summit. I got, 
I got to the balcony camp, which is one mile from the summit. By the time I got to the balcony camp, I was coughing up blood. And um, how? What's the elevation at that camp? Uh, Eighteen. Nineteen five. Nineteen. Okay. Yeah. So you're you're at nineteen at that point, and you can see the summit, and it's a it's a razor edge ridge, and this little stupid voice in my head, the voice in my head goes, "You can make the walk to it, but you can't get back." You know, I can get to the summit, but I'm pretty sure I can't get down. And um, the guy, the lead guy, the guide, he sat down with me. He's like happy and smiling. And he goes, you have 24 ambulatory hours. The ethics of the mountain says it's totally your choice. If you want me to guide you to the summit, I'll guide you to the summit. But you're not coming down. You can't make it. So, wow. Uh, okay, let me, and, and plus your brain soup at that altitude. Every thought is like you're trying to shove something through mud, and you're thinking, do I want to live or do I want to die here? Um, it's odd, and I finally said, I'm going down, and, and he goes, good. He goes, right choice. But I, I took three weeks up and one 24-hour hike down. I, the most important thing to me, I mean, the thing that defined everything I did uh, at that point is we were moving from um, Camp 4 to Camp 5. And uh, it's a crevasse field. So we're roped, and essentially the end of the world is on either side of us, right? And um, the, we walked this crevasse field, and the, the guide said, he goes, Are, we had ice axes. He goes, I don't think the axes will hold. If anybody goes off, off this foot-wide trail, we're all going. We're going to take the ride. And uh, we had one, we were all pulling 100-pound carts. We only wow. had one cart that wasn't hardwired, that didn't have aluminum stays. It was just on rope. And he goes, who'll take this? This is the dangerous one. I said, I'll take it. I'll take it. I said, I need to be the last man on the rope. I'll take the, I'll take the cart. And the whole time I'm walking, I mean, the cart is swinging like a pendulum down in the abyss. I take a step, and it would swing, and I take a step, and it would swing. And um, um the, the fog closed, closed in, the, the clouds closed in, you couldn't see anything. Uh, I'm pretty sure that part of me will be on that trail for the rest of my life. Uh, you get through it, and then you know you have to do it three more times because you go up once, dump stuff, go back, pick up stuff, move camp. But we, we finally had this camp, and it was great, and a storm came in, and uh, it was we were trapped for a day. Six feet of snow, we had my, my climbing partner and I had to alternate going outside and digging out the tent vents so he wouldn't suffocate. And um, we get up, the, it's beautiful, sunny, and there's all this snow, and we start, uh, um, we, we just before we start up, um, the, our guide says, we lost two uh, in, in one of the other teams. We lost two. And I said, okay, okay, we lost two. You know, you got to pay attention here. And so we start up across another crevasse field. It wasn't quite as narrow, but it was still a crevasse field. So you didn't have any place to go. And I'm looking up, and, and the ridge line, which is now loaded with snow, the ridge line let go. And it was the sound of the end of the world. I mean, it was uh, booming thunder, and all you could see is a mountain coming apart. The oh, entire wow. top part of the ridge line, you saw the crack run along the bottom. And, man, people start screaming and stuff and shit. They're throwing themselves on the ground. People threw themselves down and started praying. And, um, you know, you're watching the mountain come down. It's coming towards you. It's a solid wall. And you're thinking, this is not good. And the guy next to me starts laughing. And I think, huh, and he's, he and I are roped together. And he starts laughing. I look over at him. And I said, what's funny? And he goes, well, it all comes down to this, doesn't it? He goes, life is now boiled down to a simple equation. Said, and that is, and over the roar, he goes, whether you face it or you turn away, that's it. That's is that real? Did you, did you come up with that to have like a, like a lovely quip to tell people all the, he really said that? I mean, I he dig it. He said that to me and I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, know. I mean, there's tears rolling down my face because no one wants to die. But here's this guy. He was an oil man. He'd been he spent a lot of time in, in the middle in the Middle East. And, you know, we're sitting there watching. And he goes, inshallah. I said, well, yeah, inshallah. Here we go. And um, it burned itself out. It was like magic. I mean, here, imagine a building coming towards you, and then like a cartoon, the building goes, dunka, 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 dunka. and then all of a sudden you're hit and knocked down by a wave of wind and grit. Wow. And the, and the guy gets up, and he goes, what I tell you? Inshallah. 
<laughs> That's awesome. And all these other guys are looking at us like, maybe we shouldn't have fallen down and screamed. But I mean, you know, what the hell? You do it, yeah. Uh, but I mean, there's lessons that, that, I mean, the hardest thing was cave diving. Because that's just batshit crazy. Where did you go to Mexico? Uh, no, I learned in the cave systems in Florida. Uh, okay. My, my primary instructor was a guy named John Olowski, who is now the instructor of instructors of instructors. He's the certifier. And, uh, yeah, the first thing he says is he goes, this course is designed to flunk you out. He goes, if we can break you, we'll break you. Because you can't be there if you break. I mean, you can't, if you can't be in there, if you rattle. And the first thing they do, they take in this, this tunnel. <laughs> and this is also true. And he, and he shows you these scratch marks in the rock. And you come out and I said, all right, what was that? And he goes, that was a woman ending her life. She goes, her husband left her because he decided it would be easier to get a new wife than a new life. And so basically she burned out her oxygen trying to claw her way out of a cave that she'd lost the rope to. You know, you have a wow. line, you lay line. Uh, but the interesting thing of all this to me is when I went into this process, you know, I'd been a firearms trainer. I mean, I trained people to shoot. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I didn't know shit um, in, in terms of decision-making under, under potentially lethal stress. I, honest to God, didn't know anything. Because, I, I, I mean, I knew what I had learned and I knew what I'd read in books, and I knew what people told me. But, you know, until, I guess, the rubber hits the road, you don't really understand, you know, what you, when you have to make a decision on McKinley and, and your, your soup, or what happens when I, I smacked a regulator against a wall about half a mile back in a cave and um, busted the regulator, you know, and so air blows out of the regulator. And then what you have to do is you have to perform a series of very specific minute activities in a specific order or you get to die in a small closed room um and and i, I remember you know i actually thought about mickey fowler the shooter because mickey fowler hmm. always used to tell me shit he goes he goes when i stand to shoot he goes i i it's like i'm in a an old school voting booth and as soon as i step to the line curtains come down all around me and there's nothing in the world but me and the target it's nothing there it's nothing I got to shoot one line. of his guns once He's incredible genius on shooting. I mean, he once again, I mean, this is a guy that nobody knows now anymore. But I mean, he, you know, he's one along with Robbie Latham and Brian Enos and yeah. you know, those guys who hammered this shit out. Yeah. How does it work to shoot fast and accurately? They're the guys that figured it out. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So you're saying you exposed yourself to enough stressful conditions that you found where you personally were able to stay composed in that those moments. Yeah, you or do. Least, yeah. You learn techniques. Um, so all, all this, these years of you doing this, you're writing as you go. So there might have been months or years between one yep. process to the next to the next. That's a lot of work. It, it was. I mean, it... it uh, and you didn't lose sight of the fact that at some point I'm going to compile enough stories to turn this into a book. Yeah. Yeah, I knew it was a book all along. Um, toward the end, it became moderately obsessive <laughs> i remember my ex so? i remember my ex saying to me it's like what the hell are you trying to prove so i'm not trying to prove anything you know i'm 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 going on the rocky standard i i don't want to win i just want to be standing at the last bell um and she's like there's no point to this there's you know you're spending every bit of money you have i am you know, i mostly work for men's journal magazines were paying me a lot of money to do this stuff and she goes, you're, you're pissing the money away. I mean, they give you money and you schedule your next trip. You know, you're going out here to do this. You're going out here. You were, you were living. I was living. Yeah. And she's like, this is nuts. She said, well, this is what I'm going to do. I mean, <laughs> you know, at this, this, this point. This was your I'm, ex that was saying this to you? Yeah. 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 Um, but, I, yeah, I met another person, you know, and we moved out to Colorado together, and she'd, uh, uh, she'd climbed big mountains. She was on uh, Mount Elbrus in Soviet Georgia when the USSR fell. Wow. Uh, that's the highest peak in Europe. And, uh, wow. So she, when she went up, it was the USSR, and when she came down, it was Russia. And she did what I would have done. She immediately bought a train ticket to Moscow because she wanted to see the tanks in the street. So she bartered off American dollars for, for Russian military medals. So I knew this woman and I were kind of simpatico because yeah. I mean, that's what I would do. What the heck? That um, sounds great. But it's, it's interesting. I mean, stress is an interesting thing. And it, it's, uh, 
Um, it's one of the reasons I'm a huge fan, as you know this, I'm a huge proponent of competition. I mean, competition is fake stress, but your body doesn't know that. I mean, your brain doesn't have any idea that it's fake. It's like, you know, cowpox inoculations against smallpox. Yeah. You know, it, it's, you're getting an inoculation against stress because I believe, um, and some people, some people agree with me. I, you know, I've spent a lot of time with some of the guys in the collective and a lot of other trainers, and, and I absolutely unconditionally believe that the difference between living and dying is lag time, the time between the stimulus and when you actually have a response. Mm -hmm. And you know there's a quarter second, 0 0.22 second built into that because it takes 0 0.22 seconds for the information to go from, you know, here to there to there to here. I mean, yeah. you can't, I've, I've worked with uh, a couple of the top fast draw guys in the world and these guys are like reptiles. Yeah. I mean, you flash a light, you sound a buzzer bang. But when you set the clock up, a big digital clock, the interesting thing is, is light goes off, buzzer goes off and nothing happens for 22 seconds. Nothing. There's not one movement. And then all of a sudden, they're moving at light speed, at warp speed. You can't beat that. It's in the wiring. Yeah. So the longer you, you have between stimulus and response, the longer time you're in the kill zone. You know, the longer late, time you're hanging. Avery, Ron Avery, he called it bloodless combat. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, I knew Ron, a uh, great instructor in his own right. Yeah. And he's right. I mean, if you can, if you can train yourself – Without dying, does that seem like a big plus? <laughs> <laughs> not to mention the point of the training is to not die, so that's kind of a kind of a good thing for your training not to kill you. Well, I always told people, I said, you know, the point of all my training was that for the time to happen to somebody else. I mean, the ideal situation is for you not to be there. Yeah. Um, and that's what we focused on, of course, on the best defense for so many years. Uh, we'll show you how this stuff works. And if you see it happening, you know what? Leave. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're in the soup, we'll tell you as to the, and we always said, and I still say, I mean, I, I, I have every so often have private students and I say, I can't guarantee that I'll get you home. Probably the same thing you say. I can teach you the best I can and I can send you to the best people in the world, but in the end it's on you. Um, and, and if you malfunction, there's nothing I can do about that. I mean, I can show you the tricks that I use to not malfunction. Sure. Um, I, I always learned to negotiate with my body, which I thought was always a good deal. And my head is, is I would always give myself, um, I, I believe the worst thing you can say in the world is I've conquered fear. You know, that's stupid. You haven't conquered it. You've put it somewhere else. Worse, you've tamped it down. Uh, I was at gym one day in Boulder, Colorado. A guy comes in, I knew marginally. He goes, hey, I'm taking the team to K2. Um, I said, cool. I said, best of luck. Best of luck to you. And he goes, yep, yep, I'm going to conquer that bitch. I'm over fear. I said, Ooh. I don't think you need to say that, brother. And he goes, why? I said, I, that's not something I need to hear. Uh, he lost himself, and worse, he lost his team. He lost like two out of five of his team, including one of those famous uh, climbers in the world. And I, I can't help but thinking, you know, if he'd have had the, the respect that mountain deserves. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to conquer that bitch. My hope is to get up and get down, you know. Um, a, a close personal friend of mine from the unit, first SFOD, he's still super fit. He's still in right now, but he's doing another job. He's got the distinction of kicking a lot of doors in as an assaulter w with the, that, that uh, uh, branch of the Army with that unit. And he, uh, sitting having drinks one night, I'm like, dude, you're still – in like peak shape he still runs two miles in like 10 minutes and he said uh i wasn't scared anymore i wasn't scared we'd go to a, we'd go to hit a house or hit an objective and i wasn't scared and I, he's got kids and he's like that's when i knew i was done i knew it was time to hang it up when i no longer had any fear response to i mean we're going to blow shit up and kill people and get shot at. And I had his words, I had no fear response. So he's like, that's when I knew it was time for me to, to go away. And that shows a guy who is very, very smart and very, very self-aware. Yeah. I mean, uh, how, and same with, you know, and so many of my friends are, are military guys and, and uh, special forces guys. One of my best friends is a plank holder on six, Dennis Chalker. Okay. Uh, Command master chief, retired Chalker. And it, it's, 
you know, we talk about this a lot. I mean, we've, you know, in a lot of settings with some of these guys is talk about stress and fear and, and um, how one addresses it. Um, because, I mean, knowing that lag time kills you, knowing that fear slows you down, well, you got to have some way to address it. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you know, and I think every person that, that addresses it addresses it in a different way. Uh, Jim Cirillo. You know, yeah. Jim Cirillo felt he had a mission on earth. Um, and that's a way of addressing that. I am going to do this because I have a mission on earth. Um, or uh, Denny, I mean, he's just kind of casual. It's like, this is what we do. Really simply, this is what we do. Um, it's what we train to do, and, and, and we do that. Um, I've always found it helpful to set, um, it doesn't work all the time, but I, I would always say to myself, you know what, I mean, it's okay to be scared afterwards. You know, it's okay to be sick afterwards. It's okay to be panic stricken afterwards. But right now, I'm really busy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the sure. processing unit really needs 100%. Uh, it's something I, and I stole this from John Shaw, a great competition shooter, John yeah. Shaw. Is, um, yeah, John was teaching uh, SAS guys for a while, you know, and, and he goes, The problem with those guys, he goes, They're the best in the world. They were the best in the world, except they really believed they could multitask. And he goes, and John was very big on, I don't believe in multitasking. He goes, the, 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 the image that I stole from him is he goes, when you're born, you get 100 pennies of concentration, 100 pennies. He goes, that's it. You can't buy another penny. You don't get an extra penny when you get older. You got 100 pennies. That's it. And your only choice is where you put the pennies. And he goes, one of the things that I taught the SAS guys was, you need to put the pennies on the front site. <laughs> All 100 of them. You know, you need to become a serial focuser. You're not multitasking. You're yeah. moving quickly between tasks. Uh, and there's a difference. You know, if you Huge. take those, you know, yeah. How many, how many people do you know that, you know, they're telling you they're multitasking and what you're doing is, well, actually doing five things crappily. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're just dim diminishing your, your productivity and your efficacy for sure. I mean, I screw up a lot, but every so often I try to sit back and say, what is it I need to be doing now? Yeah, that's a great, a great habit for anything, especially with all of this shit now, phones and that. I'll go to like check, what's Mike's email? And next thing you know, I'm reading Facebook posts yep. and crap. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's like we live in a world that's designed to distract the crap out of us. I mean, it's just like, whoa. It was Coach, Coach Lou Holt said, uh, uh, coined to the what's important now phrase, win. You ever heard that? Yeah, I have. Yeah. One of my Green Beret guys that I do work with, his name's Z Durham. He's a fifth group guy, another badass, and he's a black belt in jujitsu as, as well as his military career. He does a whole speech with, with uh, students when, we, when we're teaching together, and he talks about enjoying your fear and understanding that, like you said, it's a physio physiological part of your makeup. Like how many of us men have an adrenaline dump and we get shaky or a quivery voice and then we feel less than – because we weren't some stone cold badass. And he said, why get upset about that? Just realize it's your makeup and then learn to work with and around it and not break down. And part of his process is what's important right now. Let's get my breathing under control. Let me see that front sight or steer away from the tree I'm sliding towards or whatever the thing might be. Well, so uh, that is so smart. And, and breathing is, is breathing is so much a part of it. You know, if you just for like, I don't know, a millisecond, focus on breathing, I am breathing. It's all of a sudden, I mean, all, you know, all the yoga and Zen stuff aside, you're back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like your mind is going, oh, okay, we got a little oxygen. What is it we got to do right now? Uh, oh, my cave diving instructor, and this is another line that sounds like I made it up, but he said, here's what you need to learn. You need to know what you need to do 100% right, 100% of the time, and learn to do that. Like, do you know Super oh. Dave Harrington? <laughs> do you know Dave? Very, very well, yeah. and I love that sounds Dave. Like, that sounds like one of Dave's isms. Dave says, and people that listen to this have heard me say it before, he says, do the right thing at the right time every time. Which... Dave, is, Dave is one of the three most wonderful guys in the world. <laughs> I can tell you this ridiculous story about uh, at a match in Florida about three or four years ago. Me and Tom Yost, who shoots for SIG, and sure. Super Dave driving. I know Tom. Yeah, we're driving to get a barbecue, and somebody, somebody cuts Dave off in traffic, 
and shoots him a bird. <laughs> it's got it. And Dave's going like, fuck, I'll free you. Dave is like, whoa. And Tom's going like, listen, we don't all want to go to the sheriff's department. And he goes, well, they'll let me out. And he goes, not me. <laughs> but I, Dave is to me just, I mean, I, uh, um, I have an open invitation next time in Tampa to come by and let him play the guitar for me. Damn it. Yeah. You know? Play some ACDC, you know? Yeah, he's, man. he's just one of those great, great guys. And um, oh, we're having dinner one night with my girlfriend in Yost. And, 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 and Super Dave goes to a big story about had trouble getting, last time he came out of Switzerland, had trouble getting his machine guns out. And my girlfriend says, why would you have machine guns in Switzerland? And Dave looks at me and he goes, tell her. I look over at her and say, he's one of those guys. And she goes, oh, yeah, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> he said, actually, he said, tell her. Yeah, tell her. <laughs> <laughs> he is, I mean, yeah, there's, there's guys out there that, you know, that it's an honor and a privilege to know. Mm. Plus, it's just funny. Yeah. And Dave's there. Cecil Birch is there. Cecil Birch yeah. is, is ongoing hysteria. I mean, yeah. Um, every time I, I see Cecil, you know, yeah, he's like, are you sure we're not brothers? I mean, are, are, you know, have we not known each other for like 40 or 50 years? I'm like, no. And he goes, that's odd. That's really he's, odd. He's Even good. like somebody like Chuck Haggard, you know? Yeah. You get past the, You get past this. I'm Chuck Haggard. Chuck Haggard's hysterical, you know? He's a, yeah, he's a sweet dude. It's funny. Nowadays that people toss around words like uh, Jedi or Master or... Uh, like these monikers they attach. Yeah. You know, my friend, my friend Mike is a he's a Jedi in the online TV shooting world, which you are. But guys huh, say yeah, that. Right. There's dudes like Super Dave, like that is like he is the Jedi dude. Like he'll one time I asked him something we're training together, and I go, I go, what do you think about this thing? I keep having this issue, and he goes, well, what do you think it is? And I told him, and he goes, well, then stop doing it. And that was the answer, you know, like, like that was it. Like I was waiting for some, you know, lengthy response and about like some pressure and, you know, push this and squeeze that and think about this. He goes, well, just stop doing it. Like, oh, okay. Dave is a guy you can imagine on some swamp planet, you know, having you, I don't know, wax the car. I mean, whatever doing that. Yeah. Uh, I do. I, well, um, it's so funny. My my friend Chalker, he was when it, one of the times he was stateside. We were having dinner in Boulder, and we were eating at a, a rest a restaurant that has an upstairs deck on the outside, and so it's it's it's, it's Denny and his wife and me and, and me and my sweetie, and we're sitting there and, and Denny's just come back from so he's teaching Iraqi special forces or some such stupid shit, and he's going, oh man, this is really hysterical. I mean, we came into the sniper fire. There was no sniper fire, and we couldn't find the sniper. And I finally told my guys, I said, listen, you got to like whack this guy. You got to get this guy to stop shooting at us. He goes, so I'm going to be like a prairie dog. He goes, I'd pop my head up till he shot at me. I'd duck down. I'd move over here. I'd pop my head up till he shot at me. He ducked down. And I looked over at him, and his wife was white. I'm sure. And, and I said, Denny, 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 Denny. <laughs> and he's just doing this, and he's laughing. I said, Denny, we have to go to the bathroom. Yeah, goes, geez. We do? I said, get up. And he's like, okay. And he goes to the bathroom. He goes, what? I said, you can't tell stories like that in front of your wife. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> and he goes, oh, shit, man. He goes, it just kind of slipped out. <laughs> That's hilarious. I said, it's just, you know, uh, she's, yeah, she's, she got, didn't she's got a funny. harder job than you. Yeah, all the nights she's sleepless in bed, and he's like, no, no, I'm okay. I'm in a hooch sleep, and he's actually popping his head up so snipers yeah. can take I, I, I hold those guys in awe. I mean, oh, heck I, yeah. I do. I just, uh, you know, I, I, they've given up so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've just given up so much, and, and, and realistically, in terms for our country, we give them so little in return. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, good Lord. <laughs> What do you think? So you've been around a little bit you've, and you've had so many wonderful life experiences that have, that have uh, exposed you to such a, a broad swath of, of America and the world. What do you think about uh, I, I, a friend of mine who I love to death, he's in his late 80s, his wife, of, uh, they were together since they were in grade school. She just passed. And that's the, that, uh, the kind of guy he is same woman all these years they've got a bunch of kids together and he's talking to me the other day about Audie Murphy and he says we don't have men like that anymore and I said well I disagree like I, I know lots of guys that I, I think are just as courageous as is him or or just as much 
uh, in love with the idea of America. What do you think about these conversations about I hear constantly, especially from older people, it's it's different, it's worse. There's uh, there's no patriotism anymore, or or things like what's going on right now. Nike just took the shoe off the, the their manufacturing list with the Betsy Ross flag. What's your comments on that? Uh, a, it pisses me off. I mean, I, I'm like you. I I know guys who are like Audie Murphy. You know, yeah. I know guys who. Uh, um, you know, a guy who it's his story and I won't tell it, but, but he was in a situation where a hot situation where people were dying and he was given a specific stand down order. And he waited like, uh, as he told me, he waited 90 seconds to disobey a direct order and to end his career and maybe put himself in prison for the rest of his life. So it's anything you regret. He goes, I wet, wet. I waited 90 seconds. He said, I should have gone on immediately I said well i mean that's an audie murphy type thing you know it's just mm -hmm. like i'd be given a direct order to stand my men down and i say that's not what moving. we do here we're moving we're going you know there's people that that we are charged with saving and we'll do that i mean and i you know i hear these stories over and over again and then you see some jerk off like colin kaepernick whatever and then they're like, he's the you know, time man of the year, and, and, and Nike gives him a billion dollars. For what? I mean, for disrespecting the American flag. I mean, I, uh, it's just not good. I mean, here we are at Independence Day, you know, uh, tomorrow. We're, we're talking on July 3rd. I mean, mm -hmm. July 4th is Independence Day. And, half, and, and, you know, to actually have said, well, a lot of people are offended by the American flag. Then go to Venezuela. I'll buy your ticket. Take dog food. You're going to need it. Yeah. Um, I, I greatly fear, and this because I'm paranoid, which I, I make no secret of. I'm in a paranoid business. Um, I, I feel like we're, we're kind of in the beginning uh, stages of Civil War II. You know, that we, are, we have entered into right now what is not a hot, low-intensity conflict. Uh, and I don't think any of us can figure out how to step back from the edge. And that, that includes me. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody says, well, why don't you talk to the other sides? Because every time I talk to the other side, they've lied to me. So what do you want me to say? I mean, it's sort of when they say, well, let's have a conversation on guns. Which one, which rights are you willing to give up? You know, that's like saying to, uh, I mean, let's take another 100% polarized situation uh, abortion not that we're going to debate it or anything sure pro-choice pro-life and so you know a, a, a pro-choice person says to a pro-life person let's have a conversation and the pro-life person says you're asking me how many babies it's okay to kill there isn't middle ground yeah and and i, I I'm, I'm deathly afraid in the situation we found ourselves in right now there isn't middle ground it's gone um you know, we I think there still is some just so my involvement in politics, the thing that I constantly try to remind people not to cut you off. Yeah. So we have like like rabid anti gun people. And I've sat with legislators that are very proud to talk to you about the bills that they've written to ban various uh, uh, instruments or uh, uh, rights. And I try to remind people, most of them honestly feel they're trying to do the right thing. That's You're the right. interesting thing. Yeah. It's not that they're Michael Bain and Mickey Shook and they shouldn't be able to have fun and have guns. They honestly feel that they're doing the right thing based yeah. on their, their moral code, based on their ideology, based on their understanding of what our union is supposed to be. The, the issue, though, uh, I think that, and I agree with you, um, when I started as more of an activist, as more of a political activist, uh, I did realize that a lot of times the people I was talking to uh, were not bullshitting. You know, yeah. they, they felt it as a deep, committed cause. Um, I, I think the problem becomes is, is, is when we look at uh, the left, the progressive left, uh, there's that line. It's classic. I forget who said it, but it's a great line, is that, Republicans think Democrats are, are, um, are uninformed, and, and Democrats think Republicans are evil. And there's a huge, you know, or the conservatives think they're wrong. The progressive side doesn't think we're wrong. They think we're evil. 
And, and that, that, that scares me because what mm -hmm. do you do with evil? What do you do with evil? Yeah, you, you crush it. You crush it. Yeah, I, yeah. There's, you know, you don't negotiate with evil. If we're wrong, we can negotiate. You posted something on Facebook the other day. It was about, um, I think it was about a, a conservative journalist in maybe Portland. I think it was Portland that got bashed about the yep. head and had some uh, fast dry cement thrown in his face. And I think the reason you posted it was like, where's the regular media sharing this information, right? They should be. Yeah. It's a story. And, yeah. and more than that, I, I shared it because this is something you and I have to think about, right? You have stepped out like me into the public. We're public. And public is, is in normal times, public is fine. In times like these, public is dangerous because public is a target. Um, I, I brought it up in, in the sense that we teach self-defense. You know, we, we preach it, but we teach it. And, and I'm saying to the people who are listening to me that you know that you can't do anything unless you've thought about it before. That's not how humans work. You need the index card. You need the programming, right? You can't do it unless you've thought about it. Even if you've thought about it right, that's that lag time thing. Yeah. Somebody comes at you with an ax. If you've never thought about that before, you've got to think, well, shit, what do I do? Oh, mm -hmm. I do X. Uh, you need, the, you need the, that programming thing to grab. So now we're in a situation where, at least in certain cities, violence is sanctioned. The police will step back. Okay. Those of us who carry a gun, you know, we have added that responsibility. You know, we have this huge responsibility of that we have a firearm. And so we're in a situation, uh, maybe not of our choice. One of the things, I, I was a, one of my other lives, I was a riot reporter. I've been to some of the most, oh, wow. you know, um, back in the uh, late 60s, the weatherman, last weatherman above ground action against the Vietnamese embassy. Uh, political riots in Miami, uh, Memphis. Um, I, I've been a lot of riots. And um, one of the things that surprised me the most about riots is that sometimes I'll be there and all this shit will be going on. Rocks will be flying and sirens and tear gas. And invariably, some guy or some woman with a briefcase walks in going like, is something happening? Hmm. Which is an incredible failure of awareness. Sure. But like, you know, the, uh, maybe the analogy I used on, on my own podcast is like you're in the ice cream store. You step out of the ice cream store and coming running down the mall are a whole bunch of people dressed in black with masks, holding big sticks and carrying cups that are milkshake cups. Okay. It's a clue. What's your situation? I mean, realistically, you, you, I, the best case, since we always did that with best defense, the best case, <laughs> step back in the ice cream door, store, close the door, lock the door, and run out the back. That's the yeah. best way. But if you don't have that card, all of a sudden people are running towards you with sticks. And in your head, all this stuff is going on. Well, is that a legal, lethal force response? Um. And that's a harder question than, you know, Andrew Bronco yeah. and I've been around this a lot. Yeah, it's, um, not that, it's not that cut and dry of man with a 20-inch machete yeah. to chop your head off that's screaming clean. I can murder you. But I, the, one of the points I made, and, and some very fine trainers do not agree with me, and let me just make that as a caveat. Um, it's not a universal thought. Part of my decision-making process at that point, let's the ice cream shop. I step out. I got a wife, a kid. I don't have a kid. I have a beagle, but I never take my beagle to ice cream shops because she eats too much. But, but in uh, this analogy, you've analogy, got her with you? I got the kid, and okay. I step out. These guys are running toward me. What is my actual knowledge? This is kind of like what Masada Oob talked about originally with, with uh, you know, the 21-foot drill with the knife. You know, Mossad wanted you to have the knowledge of how fast a person could cover 21 feet and put the knife in your throat, right? I have, I, um, we were filming in Kansas City a year and a half ago. President Trump had spoken there that day. And as it happens, we were, we'd taken over, we'd rented a restaurant. We were doing a, a restaurant attacks. Myself, Mike Seeklander, <laughs> Mike Janich, uh, and five of Mike Janich's primary martial arts trainees and five of Seeklander's people. So let us say that that restaurant in Kansas City was the safest place on earth. 
right there. My director of photography had a gun on. So I'm outside blocking the door with one of my other grip people because we don't want people to look in there and go, holy Jesus, and, you know, killed by bystander. And uh, the, the, the Antifa demonstration had broken up, and all the little Antifa boys were walking past us, boys and girls, all in black. They had pulled down their mask. All of them had flags. Now, one of the flags was an axe handle. One of the flags was a two by two on an axe. The, the pole flag was, a, was a depiction of an axe handle. No, no, the, the, I'm sorry. The flag, oh, the like black the flag. anarchy oh. flag, was oh, nailed shit. to an axe handle. Jeez. One was nailed to a two by two, and one was duct taped to a black painted piece of uh, plumbing pipe. Holy crap. Those are deadly weapons by Hell definition. Yeah. And one of the guys, I mean, big guy and I thought it was funny. He looked back over at me and got the axe handle. He, he grinned and slapped the axe handle in his hand, and he walks off grinning. And the person with me goes, and the angel of the Lord passes over this silly little boy. Uh, you know, open the door to this restaurant. This is the end of your world, you know. But uh, um, funny. I know that, though. I mean, so I have direct knowledge of Antifa demonstrators carrying, quote, unquote, black anarchy flags, but with great big, thick things that can, can, can pound me. Let's say I'm, I step outside the ice cream store. I see a, a girl all in black with a mask throw a milkshake, and I see it hit a bystander, and that bystander is driven to the ground. I know a milkshake cannot drive you to the ground. So I see guys with big sticks. I see them throw a milkshake and somebody go to the ground. I think I have entered a lethal force situation. If I can't get out, let's say, for example, there's a smart proprietor in the, uh, in the ice cream store, and she steps up and locks the door behind me. Because yeah. you see that happen in riots all the time. Yeah. So now I'm here. I'm here. I have people under my care. That is always my, I, I feel anyway, I, I feel very strongly. Um, when we choose to carry any weapon, when we choose to take responsibility for our own safety, those under our care, our primary care, I mean, uh, I think I stole this from Clint Smith. You know, he's in an active shooter situation. What does he do? He gets his family the hell out of it. Yeah, we you know, teach so, the same thing. Yeah, I'm in a situation where people that I love are at risk. I that's, think that's your, I, that's your first duty. My first duty. My first duty is to get them out of there. From being in riots, I know that you have limited choice. Yeah. You know, you, you don't have unlimited movements in a riot. Sometimes you go where the crowd goes. Yeah. Um, maybe you can work your way out, but where you've got people in uniform, quote unquote. This is even more dangerous than what I think of as just a general riot where everybody goes like batshit crazy. You've got people in uniform. So let's say I'm wearing a suit. They have a pretty good idea that I'm not Antifa. You yeah. know, maybe I, I don't have an Antifa button. I'm not black. I don't have a mask. I stand out. It's conceivable at that point that, that I have a shooting situation. Um, at that, my best case at that point in the scenario I described, which is a lose-lose scenario, there's not, if you can't get back in the ice cream shop, there's not a win. There's not a win on that table. There's only survival. Yeah. My goal would be to back myself into a situation where I can protect those in front of me with a gun in front of me. I don't want to shoot anybody, and I don't know anybody that's ever wanted to be shot, right? I and mean, right out of a John Wayne movie, right? Or no, Danny Glover. I don't want to shoot you, and you don't want to be shot. Um, I got this gun out. Who's going to volunteer first? The guy with the axe handle, the guy with the milkshake? Who's going to volunteer to take the first bullet? I'm betting no one. But at the other time, on the other hand, I recognize that if someone runs up and pulls back like this with what appears to be a milkshake, and I've just seen that same milkshake knock somebody down, I can't risk being driven to the ground. Right. I can't risk that's it. A, that's a shit sandwich decision. It is. It's, and that's, we did that on Best Defense like once a year and, and – I used to drive Janet crazy. Some scenarios are lose lose. Yeah, they're survival scenarios. What do you what, do? What part of that do other people not agree with? Um, that there's always some happy way out of a. No, that that you can never totally be sure that the milkshake isn't a milkshake, and that's why that's I the, brought that's up the gamble. 
of deciding to, yeah. And, and, you know, their response is, are you willing to risk your life in prison? And my response is, am I willing to risk life in prison for the people I love? The answer has to be yes, or I don't want them. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I might not pay a high price, but I am saying that you are not going to kill my loved ones over me. Yeah. I you think know? based on the totality of the circumstances, that's what somebody has to look at. If all of, if you are at a, a, a an amusement park and an eight-year-old kid is going to throw a milkshake <laughs> at you, that's different than being in a riot where you've got or, dogs with masks on and you've already seen this stuff happen, right? And, you know, you're looking at a flagpole. I think you and I know what a flagpole looked like. I mean, I've seen flagpoles held on yardsticks. Yeah. I know if you hit me with a yardstick, it don't amount to it. As my friend Charlie Daniels said, a nickel's worth a warm piss. You know? <laughs> if I'm looking at, you know, you got a little aluminum tube and you're waving something around, I don't care. But I also know what an axe handle looks like. I also know what a piece of plumbing pipe looks like. If it's threaded at the bottom, I don't care what, what color you've painted it. Yeah. You know, flagpole. Yeah, there's some intent know. there. Uh, 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 all of those things are not comfortable to walk around the street with. You would want a light little aluminum pole or a dowel rod. That person has got intent, even if it's just in, inducing fear. And then that's, you know, that's, a, that's my point is that you had to look at the, exactly what you said, I think. You look at the totality of the situation. Uh, I'm looking at these people. Gosh, a lot of people are carrying great big sticks. Gosh, they're all running toward me. Gosh, they just threw something at that woman, and that woman stumbled and fell down. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I want them to do is pass by me. You know, what I want them to do is leave me and mine alone. No sticks, yeah. no milkshakes, no nut, not even harsh language. You know, I'm not going to try to stop you. My job isn't to quell the riot. I mean, I, said, yeah. I think that's what they're supposed to pay police officers to do. You know, they should be quelling the riot. My job is simply to keep my, my people safe. Yeah. And, you know, I'll take, you know, like I said, my, 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 my number one thing is leave. I, I've, you know, a, a cave diving, my cave diving instructor said this. Within, um, within the cave diving community, this is really interesting, uh, my lead instructor told me that, uh, in the very first days is that no one really understands what keeps them alive. And I've heard the same thing from guys in combat. Nobody really understands how X dies and Y doesn't. You know, somewhere maybe it's the capriciousness of the universe. You know, maybe something, who knows, maybe you felt a hinky thing, moved your head, the bullet went past you. Um, but my cave diving instructor said, we never know. So within the cave diving community, it is considered the height of, of, of boorishness to question why a dive is canceled. If you want to cancel a dive at any point, you do this, and it is over. No one will ever say to you, why'd you do that, dude? This is how extreme that is in the cave diving community. I was diving uh, some of the, uh, the caves in Florida. We were down a different time diving the caves. And uh, a whole bunch of cave divers from around the world had come in to dive with this woman, really famous woman diver. She'd actually mapped these caves. She was the mapper. And so it was an honor for these other divers to come from all around the world to dive with her in, you know, in these caves she's mapped so she can point out stuff, right? So they're all there. They're, you know, all over. They're putting on and cave gear is a lot. Do you guys of, have comms while you're diving in these caves? We do usually now, yeah. Okay. But it, usually the comms are gone in the caves. Okay. Uh, but, I mean, we've got a lot of gear. I mean, you know, multiple tanks, bailout tanks. There's a redundancy, 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 three of everything. Uh, and you've got to tie it off in a certain – so these guys are getting all ready to go. It's pain in the butt. It's like getting ready, I guess, putting on a wedding dress, you know. <laughs> and, I, wouldn't um, know. I wouldn't know. Oh, well, I, I look lovely <laughs> in lavender. Um, so this woman drives in in her pickup truck. And she comes in, everybody's like, oh, here she is. We're getting ready to go. She rolled down the window of the truck. She stuck her hand out. She stuck her thumb up in the air, called the dive, rolled the window back down and left. Nobody said a word. Everybody just started taking all their stuff off. And um, that, to me, is, is, uh, uh, it was an important lesson to me. Because my, my instructor added, he goes, sometimes the most manly thing you will ever do in your life is walk away from it. It's because you know what? Every pressure in the world is going to be your ego. All that freaking testosterone mm-hmm. is going to be saying, I feel a little hanky, but I'm a man. 
Yeah. He goes, but you have to say at some point, I am able to walk away from something and I can't fully articulate to you why not. Because I felt weird. And I, I've been on dives with John, you know, and, and I'm at training dives. And one dive we were doing multiple levels. So you get to the floor of the cave. There's a hole in the bottom of the cave. You go in the hole. You're in another cave. You're in the hole. I we were down like two holes in just a deep cave. And all of a sudden, John looks at me and does this and started to resurface. And, uh, you know, so, okay, we get out. And he goes, just because you're new, you're newbie, new guy, F, you know, F and G, um, at that last hole, I thought, this is the last hole I'm ever going to go in in my life. And I called it. I said, we're you, going You home. did? No, he did. Okay. And he's the instructor. Okay. He said, I felt it would be the last thing I ever did. And he goes, so Intuition I called Intuition is it. a pretty cool thing. It is. But, you know, we, have, we live in a culture where we pound intuition down. Yeah. I mean, you don't go into work one day, and, you know, the next day your boss says, why'd you not come in? He goes, I, you know, I felt hinky about going into work. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to get the day off with pay, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I personally think that uh, take the cosmic shit out of the equation. All of the things our subconscious mind has learned about physic, the, the physics of this world we live in, it, it, we process things, and then we don't listen. That's For it. parts of us that process this stuff, don't walk down that alley. Don't get in that guy's car. Don't go down that cave today. Just shit ain't right. And it, it, it is processing data that we don't see with our conscious brain. Because we have all these senses, right? Every yeah. one of those senses is being flooded with external data. And it's all getting stuffed into the back part of our head. You mm -hmm. know, and analyzed by the back part of our head, you know, which we don't have direct access to. Yeah. You know, so, you know, in a, in a situation that looks bad, I, I want to disappear. You know, I, I want, I'm with you. Uh, you know, I, I want out. I don't ever, I, ever. I have a, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead. That's, I was going to say, I've got a younger brother. His name's Tom. He's done a lot of cool jobs. He was in the army. But besides that, he, uh, he and I both suffered from chronic anxiety as kids. Mm -hmm. I used to be panic attacks daily. Another story altogether. But he and I in our 20s decided, like, we're going to figure this shit out. And so we started doing things similar to your book. Not always just exciting physical sports stuff, but things that scared us. Because we knew that challenging the fear, not in an unsafe mm -hmm. way, but like, for me, public speaking, yeah. I, I would yeah. shit my pants. <laughs> I one time, I tell students this when we're talking about stress inoculation. I gave a... Uh, uh, introduction at a political event, maybe five or 600 people were there. And this is about uh, eight or 10 years ago. And I had talked to hundreds of people before, but for some reason, the people in this group, a lot of them were my peers, people I looked up to. Uh, and it was like a two minute thing. You know, it's my friend, Mike, he's a great guy. Come on up, Mike, you know, nothing. Uh, about a minute out, all of a sudden it, I, I'm not going to go check my hair and make sure I don't have any food in my teeth. And I'm looking at myself in the bathroom. I looked down and saw my heart doing about 200 feet a minute. And, and I, you know, I, I, like in my head, it's like, Mick, you're 29 years old, 30 years old, whatever I was. You can walk to your truck and go home. You don't have to do this. These people can't make you. You can text somebody or send an email and say you didn't feel good. And it won't be a big deal because you're not the keynote speaker. And I like it. Uh, started running all this shit through my head and I looked at myself and this was like a big moment for me, even though it's stupid. I thought, and if you do that, you'll probably always do that. And like, I started thinking about it and I took some deep breaths and I was sweating like crazy. And I went and gave my, my, my stumbly speech, which everybody said I sounded fine. And, but to me, it was like the worst <laughs> thing in the world, but I, I forced myself to do it. And there's no, there's no loss of life in that besides looking foolish. But my brother became a very accomplished rock climber, uh, skydiver, tower climber. He'll send me a picture. Uh, I'm 1,100 feet up in a, a blizzard oh. on Lake Superior, you know, literally at oh. the top of some, like, radio tower having to change a light bulb or something on Christmas Eve kind of stuff. But every month or two, he loses a friend. He just lost a friend. I shared it on, on uh, Facebook. A uh, free solo climber. The kid died down oh, in – yeah, uh, yeah. I, I saw don't that. know if you saw yes. that, but – like these guys are as, as skilled as you can get at a certain craft. And that's a whole other level of human that the, the comfort that they have with death, but those guys will do the same thing. Yeah. We're not climbing today or we're not flying today or we're not 
whatever the thing is because they they understand if they don't feel good about it and everything in their their brains not on point we're not going and that's i i think everyone should should accept that i mean uh, I Gavin De Becker is an anti-gun guy, but guy, but in a lot of ways, Gavin De Becker's gift of fear touched on a lot of those points that um, we actually know things, but then we spend all this time with our forebrain talking ourselves out of it. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. well, no, that's just you know, maybe I am biased. Maybe I'm like, no, you know, just go with it. The worst that can happen is you can look stupid. Yeah, and and looking stupid is always better than the hospital, you know. It, it, yeah. it's uh, I once know, I would... rode a bicycle off the back of a of a one ton <laughs> pickup truck, and uh, now that's stupid. <laughs> it was straight up dumb. I had a group a group of girls. I was in maybe fifteen or fourteen years old. I never told my parents the truth until actually a few years ago. I said, I bet I could jump my bike off the back of that pickup. This is like a one big old one ton truck. So I drug it up there. I had no skills to do such a thing. But once I got up there, I didn't want to say no. And my screaming <laughs> was screaming, don't do it. I pedaled one time, drove straight into the pavement, broke my head, broke my collarbone, blacked out. And to this day, I, I will talk to some of these people that are now grown adults. And they'll say, do you remember that? I, yeah, man, I remember <laughs> when, I, when I was doing over the edge, I, I was in New Zealand, right? And um, what did you do there? I did lots of because New Zealand has no liability laws. So there's a lot oh, of things wow. you can do in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand criminal law doesn't allow you to assign liability. Interesting. Uh, there's negligence there. However, if you say, I'm going to do this, then, hey, it's on you. And uh, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to pitch a kayak over a waterfall. And, That's the um, front cover of the book. Front cover of the book. Okay. It's three stories up, which is not you know, three, three and a half stories. The water's freezing cold, and the rapids below it are not survivable. You know, they're, they're way above class five. You can't survive the rapids below it. So you got to ditch the boat. And so you, place, were gonna, you were going to you know, jump over, man. Boom, and then jump out and get the hell out of the boat. So then, like, you've only got seconds to climb your ass out of the, canoe, right. or the, the kayak and swim to shore. Swim like crazy, which I did. But while I was there... <laughs> so I'm assuming there's a deep plunge pool at yeah, the bottom. Yeah, because you know it's essentially it, it's as deep as the waterfall is long. Oh wow! And so you know, and I actually skewered the boat in the bottom. It's like whoo, bam! And then when when it went bam, I'm like I'm out of here. Whoo, I'm gone. Boat went sailing off. You know, I paid a fee. Uh, but I ran into an MTV sports crew. That was when MTV had this big sports show. It was weird. And the guy goes to me, he goes, "You know anything about river surfing?" I'm like, no. I'm what is it? And he goes, "Well, it's kind of like." whitewater kayaking without the kayak I said ah well what would you use and he goes a boogie board and a helmet so well that sounds interesting <laughs> I mean, what could possibly go wrong wow. and uh so i scouted this river and it was maybe a four or five river uh, and i walked to the wrinkle of it i looked at the drops and everything i looked at the uh the uh the hydraulics and everything i thought this isn't bad so i had a dry suit and i i went we couldn't find a boogie board because it's new zealand so I went to a New Zealand equivalent of a Walmart, and I, and I bought a pool toy, a styrofoam pool toy. And uh, I had a helmet. <laughs> and I get at the river, and I think, I wonder if this is smart. Uh, and then I stepped into the river. And, you know, I went through the first drop pretty good. It was a big drop, and I, I lined up on it. Now, what I failed to understand is that when you're in the river, it's not like being above the river in a kayak or a raft. You can't so your knees shit. are probably just bouncing off you're of rocks in it, and stuff. And all you're seeing is the water, you know, and I made the first drop. And then the next thing I remember, and I swear to God, this is another stupid story that is actually true. The next thing I remember, I'm sitting in a restaurant and I have a fork in my hand. The fork has an excellent smoked salmon pasta on it. Mm. And in front of me is a really pretty good Cabernet. You know, and a plate, and there's all these people around me, and I look around, I'm like, rut row. And I look, and I do recognize my girlfriend, and I'm like, honey, can we step outside for just a moment? And she goes, okay. And I put my fork down, stepped outside, and she goes, what's wrong? I said, where the fuck am I? She goes, you're in New Zealand. I said, what the fuck am I doing in New Zealand? And she oh, goes, no. what do you remember? Said, Nothing. I said, I remember putting my foot in the water. And I said, that river's in New Zealand? She goes, yeah. I said, you're sure we're in New Zealand? She goes, trust me. I said, what did I do? And she goes, yeah, well, 
She goes, you went through the whole tier of rapids. You did the drops. And she goes, you swam out of the river. You climbed up a bank, a steep bank. You shucked your wetsuit. You put on your clothes. We went to a restaurant. You ordered the wine, and you ordered smoked salmon pasta for me and you. She goes, hum, did I seem strange? She goes, it's a hard baseline with you, but yeah, you, you <laughs> might have seemed a little odder than usual. I said, I don't remember anything. I don't know who these people are. I remember nothing except putting my foot in the water. And she goes, well, you lucked out of this one. Um, I assume I hit my head hard enough to hit reboot, and it rebooted. Um, and I always thought it was a doctor. Uh, yeah, I, I had a doctor that I kind of worked with going through this whole thing, and his response was, "What did you expect, you moron?" Uh, I was not really up on bedside manner. <laughs> did you ever uh, end up getting a scan or anything of your brain after they that? They scanned it, and they said you seem to be okay. Uh, and they said you can't keep doing this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, sure I can. I mean, they're like, okay, <laughs> you'll pay That's the freight. That's scary. That's and, and scary. It, it scared me more than almost anything I've ever done because, you know, when you, when you go to your head and you go like, oh, there's nothing there. <laughs> you know, it's like a broken tooth. You're going like, come on, come on. You know, the salmon was excellent. Um, but, I, I, you know, I finally, as I got older, I got past it and, uh, you know, I don't know, a decade ago, I told my girlfriend, I said, I'm, I'm done cave diving. I've been down in Mexico in the cenotes and uh, uh, the host Nashish and uh, Dos Ojos, the two big systems there. But I was on, you know, they're, they're map systems. We're on, we're on map systems and, you know, we're interesting stuff. Saw a whole mammoth skeleton under, underwater. And, oh, you know, wow. A fire pit from where that part was above the ground in the last ice age. That's so cool. I, I got back and I told my girlfriend, I said, I'm done. I sell, sell the gear and walking away from it. And she goes, you're sure? I said, yeah, because I, you know, I don't do it enough to not die. You know, I don't, I don't have the chops. You know what you mean? I mean, we were talking about yeah. earlier, you know, your friend, you lose the chops at some point. And she started crying. She just burst out crying. And I thought, what an asshole I am. I mean, sometimes we fail to, you know, realize what us doing stupid shit has the effect on the people who do love us. Yeah. You know? Um, she was all, and she, like I said, she's done a lot of, a lot of sketchy stuff on her own, but she was like, no, when you start getting into that stuff, you know, you're kind of, you are, you finally found the edge, you know, this is where the edge lives out there. You You've know? had an amazing life. Cave diving, uh, swimming with sharks and at Alcatraz, probably died in that river. Who knows? Maybe like an alien yeah. took you up into yeah. space. <laughs> <laughs> and That's, and okay, all right. I was once beaten up by Chuck Norris. Did he literally beat you, or you guys just had some fun? Oh no! I right, quick story. All right, I'm a rock critic, or I was, you know, I was in Florida, and my Randy Travis is a good friend of mine, a country singer. Sure. And um, um, you know, I'd kind of been around him. So I was one of the people when I was a real rock critic that Warner Brothers brought in to decide whether they wanted to hire him. You know, I saw him at a chicken wire club in, uh, in Chattanooga, uh, you know, where they threw bottles at the stage and shit. And I said, ah, oh, this guy's great. Hire this guy. It wasn't just me, but there are others. I was one of the listeners, but, um, he was in Maui. He calls me up one day. He had a house in Maui. And he goes, you want to go to Maui? I said, oh, always. Why would I not? And he goes, I'm filming a movie, a cowboy movie. You want to be an extra? You want to be a cowboy? yippee ki -yay. uh so he, he goes and plus like all of us he's got enough coupons to go to the moon it's not like it's airfare you know yeah so i went to hawaii and and uh, i i trained in uh muda kwan tung Sudo, and that's where my rank is or was and and uh i'd work with randy a little on some martial arts stuff and he goes i got a martial arts trainer traveling with me you're gonna love him and i'm like okay and he goes i'd like you to meet chuck norris i'm like <laughs> I mean, Mr. Norris, so shake hands. And he's very nice. You know, it's all casual. You're Randy's friend and everything. And then Chuck Norris asked the important question. He goes, Randy says you have a black belt. I do. And he goes, in what style? I said, Muda Kwan Tung Sudo. And he looks at me and he goes, that's my style. I said, yes, sir, I know. <laughs> and so now all of a sudden it changes. I'm not Randy's friend. I'm junior student. And so we were out on the beach, and he's like, I'm going to show you a few things. Michael Gard, 
And and then he would be talking, lecturing to Randy, and I'm there. I'm blocking like crazy. I'm like, your God, this guy's fast. And eventually, you know, you feel his foot going, dwang, and you bounce off the sand. And you, you shake it off, and you get up, and he goes, Michael Gard. And all of a sudden, he come at you again. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I always was in the sand. And, um, and Randy pulls me aside. He goes, what happened? You and he were getting along fine, and now, now look at you. <laughs> so, senior student, head of art. I, I'm his crash test dummy. That's the way it works. And then Chuck Norris goes, his guy just picked up at the airport. He goes, Michael, you're going to love sparring with him. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. He goes, this guy's traveling with me. He's working with me. He's helping it out. Uh, maybe you've heard of Jorge Grassi? Oh, no. Oh, dear Lord. Uh, yes, sir. I am so pleased to meet you. Like being struck by freaking lightning. I mean, before the word guard got out of his mouth, my face is in the sand, you know, and this guy's on my back pounding my head in the sand. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you know, and that would be like tap, 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 tap. You know, and this went on like the whole afternoon and everybody's going like, boy, this is really fun for us, but that guy. He's suffering. You know? That's hilarious. Next, did you maintain next, a relationship with him? No, I never no. did. I, I do with Randy. Randy and I, I stay yeah. in touch, you know, after his stroke and his bad stuff. Uh, but, I mean, it was, it was uh, um, I, I think it's important to have a checkered career. I mean, you might as well. Um, and I always thought that that was important. I, uh, um, uh, you just never wanted, I never wanted to be normal, you know. I, what I, is it, normal anyway? I don't. I think it's it's normal is boring. I think I just talked about this with one of my kids. Both my children. My daughter is eighteen. My son's twenty. I was talking with my daughter recently about normal's like a fancy way of saying not trying. Yeah, that's kind of the it, way I look at it. Nothing is important enough to you to risk something. Yeah. You know, you're you're not willing to put it out there. You're not willing to go ahead and take that chance. And uh, I, you know. What is, I think it's Helen Keller, right? Life is a great adventure or it's nothing. Um, and I, there's something to that. And not, not to diss my, you know, I have uh, uh, sort of my, my cousin who is in effect my brother, the closest living person that I grew up with. You know, he's worked 25 years in the same factory and he's worked his way up from the guy that swept up to the guy that runs the place. And I have nothing but enormous respect for him and his kids. But I mean, it's, it's, it's a decision that I couldn't make. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, I, I just didn't want to do it. There was, I, I read when I was in high school, I read a story by Robert Heinlein, the great, you know, libertarian science fiction writer. And the title of the, the story was, We Also Walk Dogs. And it basically postulated a company that was a general services company. You know, what did you do? I don't know what you pay me to do. <laughs> you know, I'll walk your dog. I'll build a spaceship. I don't give a shit. I mean, yeah. where do you put the money on the table? I'm, my company will do that. You need security for aliens? Yeah, sure. You need a decent launch? Yeah, I can make that too. And I thought well, that was where you got that whole specialization is for insects. You know, the classic Heinlein line. I'm like, wow, maybe I could just be a nitwit. You know, or, or, or the, the Japanese novelist Hir, uh, Hirokomi, uh, what's it? Hiroki Murakami you know, classic weird Japanese novelist. He once wrote a book called The Wild Sheep Chase. Hmm. And that, uh, it postulated, why can't we be as free as a wild sheep? And I thought, oh, what the hell? Why not? Um, I dig that. Is there anything that you, that you wanted to try in your life that you never got around to doing? And, and maybe uh, if you could go back, you would have done? I, I don't... I, or do you not waste energy on such things? I don't think so. I don't think you can focus on the past at all. And I, um, and, and I think that doesn't make you a good person, just to be clear. I mean, we used to say, I used to tell people I have the attention span of a gnat, and it makes me a great journalist and a really crappy person. Uh, hmm. But I, I, I tend to not think in terms of backwards. You know, I tend to try to be forward looking on things. And sometimes I, I look back on stuff, and, and it almost surprises me. I'm like, Wait a minute. No, I did that. That's, <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 uh, uh, as Cecil Birch said, goes, you're the guy that came up with a theory that rock and roll happened because Memphis was destroyed by yellow fever epidemics. I said, yeah, that was me. And he goes, but that's in textbooks now. So it just goes to show you, dude, 
history is made by assholes like me who make stuff up. <laughs> don't believe anything, you know. But I, you know, I don't know. I just recently I, I I've taught myself to bake. Uh, yeah, I did. I love I, baking. That was going to be my profession at one point in life. Was it? I mean, that's so cool. Uh, my sister used to work for a bakery when we were in. She must have been. 14 she'd go there at like three in the morning and help the baker and i started showing up and i thought this is great it's a cool thing yeah know? it's science chemistry yeah but then you got to do it your whole life and it kind of yeah that's what i didn't like i sort of yeah. went to cooking school for a while um like uh, like two nights a week for six months um with a, a real high zoo chef and uh it's because he taught a group of women who are really really rich women who's like one's husband owned a planet or something that's <laughs> and so they were paying him and then uh, i did a story on him for a magazine and they're like you're really actually an okay guy would you like to join the sorority and so i, I became fascinated with cooking. So you're drinking pinot grigio with a bunch of housewives yeah. talking about yeah and then but then you start the chef starts turning the knob and if you've been around a bakery you know they can turn the knob it's first it's like let's have fun cooking and then it's like if you burn the white sauce i'll hit you with the pan yeah. you know it was that kind of gordon ramsay <laughs> we all did like a brief like week apprentice in his big restaurant i mean that's it makes cave that's cool fun it was terrifying pots were flying around and shit and you're stirring like oh jesus oh jesus oh jesus don't don't you know oh god don't let this ruin <laughs> you know and he's going where is it where is it you know like but um just recently i ended up watching all those british baking shows and i thought damn, I can't bake worth crap. So I've, I've, been, uh, I've been teaching myself to bake. <laughs> what do you like to bake? Um, English desserts, because they're not as sweet as American desserts. Yeah. You know, when you, when you, bake, a, you, know, you, you bake a cake that, that's off an English recipe or Brit recipe, um, there's a, in fact, there's a recipe that the sainted Paul Hollywood, Paul Hollywood's like one of the hosts on British Baking Show, and he's, he is, I think, the coolest guy in the world. Because he's a race car driver and he travels around England and he plays like houses, like music houses, you know, except he bakes. So he's like a touring professional baker who races, drives a race car. I mean, that's cool. I mean, you could that's make super that cool. Up. Um, but one of his recipes is for uh, uh, it's a cross between a cheesecake and uh, a carrot cake. Delicious. It is. And it's not sweet. I mean, I made and what I do I is like I give it to the baker. that are too sweet either. No, and and after I started eating the 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 British desserts, I started couldn't eat the American desserts. I'm like, why yeah. we, why is this stuff so sweet? You know? Yeah, we've we've way overdone it on sugar in America. Yeah, the Brits yeah. don't do that at all. And so yeah. I've got I got like three Paul Hollywood cookbooks. And right now it's summer, and um, I live uh, my sweeties in my house. We built this five years ago. It's 100 percent off grid. Uh, solar backed by propane. Uh, One of my buddies was out at your house from Polymerady and told, was telling me about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, the secret hidden bunker is, in fact, yeah. off grid. Yeah. Um, and all these assholes out here, I mean, it's Colorado. You know, everybody wants to be green until you go to a bank and say, I want a loan to build an off grid house. Yeah. And they finish yeah. laughing. <laughs> yeah. I used to be involved in that business a little bit. And that, it's, it's hilarious when guys talk about that. It's going to save money. And do you know how much you're going to spend <laughs> to build such a thing? That's crazy. It it hurt. I mean, I can, <laughs> and plus, I, the, I'm, the first place we went to in Boulder, right? Because we lived mm -hmm. in Boulder, and, and uh, we lived in Netter. I've rafted the creek through town there. Yeah, so you know Boulder, and you know mm -hmm. Boulder is Boulder. Yeah. So I go to this place, and there's the best place in Boulder for self-sustaining off-grid housing. And I go in, and the guy's like um, – president of the company is like this is a great deal because it's a big big money project and uh he goes so which appliances do you want i'm like oh do 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 and i said a coffee maker and he goes oh, a coffee you want a coffee maker i said yeah dude and he goes i suppose you're going to tell me you want a dishwasher and I said, oh yeah and he goes oh my god he goes you're what's wrong with the world. You don't care about Mother Gaia at all. I said, dude, I don't want to move to the 19th century. I just want to live off grid. And he goes, you are a horrible person. I said, no. <laughs> I said you know what, I, I got to tell you, dude, I would pretty much put Mother Gaia across the pool table and go at her with the cue. And he goes, get out of my office. <laughs> he threw me out. 
That's hilarious. So you did it on your own. Uh, I had to, we eventually, you know, we used two or three different companies because Juan said, we, we're the best guys in northern Colorado for off-grid. I said, how big an off-grid house you ever built? It was 230 square feet. <laughs> that's a tent. It's a yurt, for God's sake. Yeah, that's probably uh, what it was. Yeah. But now after five years, it's, it's working. It, uh, um, they're, they're, they are a, a work in progress. I'm a carpenter by trade, actually. And we, we had built a handful of them. And I had found the ones that we did. It was something over the course of six months to a year. It was like, all right, we got to tweak this with the solar system. Absolutely. We got to tweak this with the battery system. We got to tweak this with the geothermal system. Oh, we got to just change this one pump speed because it's not working in October, but it works most of the year. Just little, yeah, little tweak. It's exactly like that. that. Yeah. And it's all like. It's such a new thing. Yeah. Everything I did to save money was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it all failed. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like you should have just sucked. The, I, the smart stuff we did is like um, we have underfloor under floor heat, hot mm -hmm. water. Hydronic or electric? Uh, it's uh, uh, propane. Blast but you have blast water blast. circulating through water, the yes. Blast, so hydronic. Yeah. Hydronic. And um, the builder said, well, I can get one of these for $400. And I said, here's a picture of one I got in a magazine. It's made in Switzerland. I want that one. And he goes, what's 5000 bucks?" I said, that's because it's efficient. I mean, you can get away with inefficiencies if you're not off-grid. Yeah. If, if you're off-grid, I mean, net is net. Yeah. You know, how fast that boiler fires and heats the water is everything. You yeah. Know? But it's a lot of little stuff like that. I mean, we, the well is 800 feet. Holy and, shit, uh, that had to cost a fortune. It, it, but once you start, you know. Yeah, they yeah, that well, yeah. that's thousands of dollars. Do you, have an out, do you have any kind of outdoor cooking there? Yeah, I got kind of a whole kitchen outdoors. Yeah. I have a, a wood-fired pizza oven and the usual grill. I love cooking outdoors in the summer, which we do a lot because, once again, uh, there's no off-grid system in the world that will carry an air conditioner. It yeah. won't do it. So luckily we're up high enough that it's, it's not maybe five days a year miserable, but I mean, it's kind of like, that's not that much. No. Um, yeah, so I cook outside. Yeah. You can deal with it. There's a couple things I wanted to ask you before, before I, I let you go. So you brought up the, the, uh, blues, your, your, yep. uh, your book, white boy singing the blues, right? Yeah. Yep. So talk about that a little bit. So I'm, I'm a blues fanatic. I met, uh, I met Buddy Guy once, and it broke my heart because he was like an idol of mine as a young man, but he must have been in a bad mood that day. So it was one of those stories where, you know, you meet somebody you look up to and then find out that they're not, they're not the dude on stage or on screen. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, the music writer who became a famous art critic, Dave Hickey, once had a line where he said, you don't have to be nice to be good. <laughs> and that's always <laughs> worth remembering. I, I'm from Memphis. and um, Oh, you are? Yeah, and, and I've been to Graceland, bless his holy name. And uh, in fact, right after he died, I was in New York City uh, editing Country Music Magazine, and Vernon Presley called me and said, would you like a tour of Graceland before we turn it into a tourist thing? And so I went down and toured Graceland with Vernon. And, cool. And uh, as I get ready to leave, he goes, I swear to God, I didn't make this up. He goes, I don't think the king would mind if you took one of his ashtrays. And I said, I couldn't do that, Mr. Presley. It would be wrong. I couldn't take the king's ashtray, you know. But because I'm from Memphis, and I, my grandfather had a drugstore in the slum. My grandmother once threw Jerry Lee Lewis out because he was nothing but trash. But um, we're in New York, and uh, with a bunch of music critic guys, and I just I, I threw out a stupid statement. I said, I wonder if we plotted. If we drew a 60-mile radius around the city of Memphis and we plotted the elements in American culture that fell within that radius, what would it be like compared to New Orleans or what Chicago or L.A. or New York City, Harlem? So we did. And, and what we discovered was that, that within that 60-mile radius, is, it's not just important. It is wildly disproportionate completely hmm. totally off the charts disproportionate you know that is memphis is where the blues came out of the fields you know the yeah. field chants came into the clubs uh you know they morphed there into essentially more urban blues that went to chicago rhythm and blues and jump blues which were much more dance oriented rockabilly rock and roll uh soul you know stacks record all happened yeah. in a in literally a few you could spit 
into the places that these and so my friends goes i wonder why that is I said i do too got to be a book in that so i i went to memphis and um i spent a lot of time uh, i'm i'm not I mean, I'm a relentless researcher, but I'm not really interested in footnotes and shit. What I want to hear is people's stories. I mean, tell me a story. And um, I spent a lot of time in Memphis asking people to tell me stories. Um, uh, Ferry Lewis. That that's why I like doing this. I want I, like I. That's one of, one of the things I enjoy most about this little show of mine is just hearing like your stories. So keep keep going. Um, Ferry Lewis, the bluesman, the great bluesman. Um, 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 I went to his house one day, and it, it's a, a shotgun house is so ramshackle. Literally, he would put glued newspaper to the wall to seal out the wind coming in. Yeah, and here's this great bluesman. I mean, and, and he goes, "Would you like me to play you a song?" I, said, I would, sir. I mean, I, I I would. And he sat on his bed and took out his old guitar and and played the freaking blues. I mean, just like it was 1920 again, 1922, 1923. That's just awesome. played his freaking heart out, you know? And, um, or I went to like Rufus Thomas, Watt Stack, the great Rufus Thomas. And he was hysterical. It was great fun. And I said, same thing. I said, would you play me a song, sir? And he goes, play me one of your hits. And he goes, I don't do that anymore, Michael. And I said, why not, sir? And he goes, that's the devil's music. And he goes, I've seen the light. I don't play the devil's music anymore. I said, could you play me some gospel? And he goes, that I can do. And it was some freaking rocking gospel. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was rhythm and blues. Or I spent time in Jackson, Tennessee, you know, with Carl Perkins. We talked about wow. how, you know, he was driving to the Ed Sullivan show that was going to make him a multi-billionaire. He's in a car wreck. His brother gets killed, and Elvis takes the date. And he takes uh, blue suede shoes which was what Carl was going to sing and takes it to be, you know, what it is, what it was became. And yeah, I asked Carl, we talked about how do you deal with that? And once again, religion. And then just as I'm getting to leave, he goes, should like me to play blue suede shoes for you? I said, I'd like that, sir. And he sat there, got out his guitar and he freaking rocked. I mean, that's, he just cranked amazing. out a version of blue suede shoes. Um, and I got to do stuff like I found the, uh, I found the doorman. At Club Handy, it was on Club Handy on Beale Street, back before Beale Street was an amusement park, when Beale Street was a dangerous place for white people to be. And when I was a kid growing up, it was a rite of passage, you know. You walk down Beale Street at night, that was the rite of passage. If you got through it in one piece, you're, you're cool. But um, the doorman at Club Handy, most famous joint on Beale Street, and the guy introduced me and he goes, this guy was on the door the night that Elvis sang the first time. I'm like, wow. oh, shit. And so I sat down with the guy. I'm like, again, tell me a story. What was it like on the door? And he's telling me about it. And he goes, he goes, white kid, man. He just, he just showed up every night. Like, let me in, let me in, let me in. And we finally like, all right, fine, fine. And, and I said, who's playing? What was playing? He goes, I don't remember. It's a jump blues band, dance band, right? So I said, jump blues. And uh, I said, how do you get on stage? And, and he goes, they thought they'd let the little white pecker head hang himself, you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, sure, little white boy. Come on up here and sing a song with us. And, you know, if you're playing Club Handy in Memphis, you are the best in the world. You are the equivalent of any, any jump blues, rhythm and blues band anywhere on the planet to be there. And I said, what do you play? And he goes, you know, Milk Cow Blues Boogie? I said, yeah, sure. And he goes, he did Milk Cow. I said, how'd that work? And he goes, well, he goes, the guys couldn't find it. And I said, how so? And he goes, Elvis would go, okay, we're going to do Milk Cow. One, two, and they'd start. And he'd go, no, no, boys, no, no, no. And he goes, he goes they couldn't find the beat that Elvis was, was doing in his head. You know, Elvis had a beat in his head. And they couldn't find the beat. And he goes, it took them about three tries to get in sync with his beat. You know, because they were playing, you know, dance blues, dance version of Milk Cow Blues Boogie. And uh, they finally hit it, you know, and Elvis did it. And he did one song and he goes, the people applauded. And he left. So what did it feel like to you? He goes, felt like somebody stepped on my grave. I said, I think that would be fair. You know, that was certainly the end of Jump Blues, you know. Um, but I mean, those were, I, I had one guy, a, he was like a big politician in Memphis. He'd become quite well off, very rich. And somebody introduced me and said, he's, he was a dance teacher on Beale Street, 30s. I said, somebody's got to have stories. And I went to him and, you know, I said, 
you know, we're in his office and it's air conditioned and all his plaques on the wall with presidents and shit. He's an important man. And he goes, you can't use my name. Good. I said, tell me a story. And he goes, I once taught a white girl to dance. I said, tell me about it. And so he tells me this story. He's a, he's a dance teacher. And he's approached by a couple and their daughter in her teens, late teens. And they say she's going to be an actress and they want her to learn the new dances, the rhythm dances, the black dances. And uh, the, the teacher's partner said, I won't teach her. I'm, no, I'm out of here. This is, this is 1930s on Beale Street. You can die doing this. You can have your ass swung in a tree for doing this. But uh, the dance teacher said, he goes, I needed the money. And he goes, I'll teach her to dance. And he goes, so he goes through this whole thing of she's coming in and she's learning and the dances get, would be fair to say more sensual. Is that fair to say? And where there was a lot of touching and moving, sure. the rhythmic. And he goes, the whole time, man, I'm thinking they're going to cut my head off and roll it down Beale Street. He goes, I'm going to die for this. And he goes, he goes, it was all really, and I said, sexual? And he goes, yes. And by this time, this guy who is a famous, powerful man, sweats pouring down his face as he's reliving this. And I'm like, wow. And, and he goes, he goes when, when she stopped, she goes, uh, he goes, I was the more, most, he goes, at the same time, I was the most relieved and the most disappointed man in the world. I said, what happened to her? He goes, she went to Hollywood, became a famous actress. Who was it? I said, you tell me your name? He goes, no, sir, I won't. I said, did she contact you? She wrote me letters for two or three years. I said, what did they say? And he goes, never opened them, threw them away. I said, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's the kind of stuff that I thought this is, you know, the blues is all tied up in that world. It's, yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, I mean, in high school, as soon as I could drive, Everybody did this, so I wasn't alone. I went to the crossroads in Mississippi, you know, Highway 45 crossroads where Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil. And I unequivocally believe that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil. And now there's a sign there that says, this is the crossroads where Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil. You can get the T-shirt. I mean, come on. But when I went there, it was nothing but a broken down old store and, and a dark night with no moon. You could see where you could maybe sell your soul to the devil in a place like that. Um, I, I was fascinated with the crossover between white and black, uh, the title of the book, which was from a Merle Haggard song. Uh, on the wrong side of the railroad tracks where people got nothing to lose, I'm the son of a gambler whose luck never came, and a white man singing the blues. Uh, that's what kind of got me in this whole, how did that interchange happen? How did the white man sing the blues? How did that work? And then how, did, how were the blues able to essentially take the, the musical rhythms of rock and roll and morph it into uh, Stax records, you know, into an Otis Redding, you know, into a Wilson Pickett. I mean, that incredible music. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's the great music of, I mean, people say, well, jazz is the only American art form. It's like bullshit. Yeah. The blues, the blues is, and, and the blues and what came of it. I mean, I love being able to, I, before it won, now it's a shrine. I mean, I was privileged and honored to be able to sit in Sun Studios and talk to Mr. Sam, Sam Phillips. Wow. You know, his son, Knox. Um, but I would sit there with Sam Phillips and talk about him being on the board with Elvis and him being, you know, just little stupid stuff. Um, as number one producer who, again, became a mentor for me in, in, in singing production, uh, Jack Clement, cowboy. Um, Jack uh, was on the uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. He's on the board with Jerry Lee Lewis. He did all of Jerry Lee Lewis's hit. Moved to Nashville, made uh, Charlie Pride a rich man. Uh, made Waylon Jennings a rich man. Uh, Cowboy was the best producer I, I believe in the world, and, and he had a production studio in his house. and And he liked me for whatever reason. I was writing books then, and I go to Nashville. I go and, and hang around his house and just sit there and watch him work. Um, and once he was working with John Prine on Ballad of a Teenage Queen where John Prine uh, had a woman singer in there, a high, high soprano, singing a high harmony. And um, he got done, you know, with the, put the vocal track down, and Cowboy looked at me, and he goes, what's missing? And I said, oh, I can add this, and I can add this. And he's like, what, 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 what? missed the whole turn there, Michael. Producers don't add. Producers subtract. You know, he goes, there's, 
there's in every song, in every piece of music, there's a central purity to it, an absolute purity to it. And the function of a producer is to help the artist free that purity. And I thought, well, shit. When I became a television producer, that's what I did. I mean, uh, it's, it's, you know, you're not adding violins. You're taking away to let the music speak for itself. Um, Cowboy's productions are, were legendary. I mean, he, uh, uh, I think I got this right. And he, one day I was over there and he goes, he goes, hey, you ever heard of some guitar player called The Edge? <laughs> and I'm like, um, uh, Jack? Yeah. I said, sure. And he goes, some dude named Bono? I said, oh, Jack. I said, that's you too, man. He's one of the biggest groups in the world. He goes, so you know him? I said, no, I know their music. And he goes, well, he turned up on my porch about a week ago. <laughs> they knock on the door. The guy goes, I'm the edge. And he goes, the edge of what? <laughs> he goes, I'm a guitar player. The Jack goes, everybody in Nashville is a guitar player. So what? And they're like, can we come in, sir? You know, and he goes, they ask me if I produce a song for him. And so he produced Angel of Harlem. Um, which is a hell of a song and yeah, different than anything song. they've done you know I love that that what angel in a devil's shoes salvation in the blues boom I mean it's perfect I didn't know if you were going to say say that the, the rattle and hum album that they did that was all spiritual. they fell in with Jack and that did was they? good um, Jack was crazy and, and uh, he once he, he did a uh, he bankrolled a, a horror movie called Dear Dead Delia with I think Agnes Moorhead it was a terrible movie, and he lost a couple million on it. But while he had the million, he decided that he could be more creative in his condo if he had a porch swing. And so he bought the condo above him and knocked out the floor, brought in a tree, anchored the tree in the condo, and then went up to the second floor, and then he put a swing in it so he could be in a swing on a tree. And then he realized that it wasn't the same, so he hired like a whole bunch of people to wire silk leaves on the tree. No. <laughs> so it looked like summer. <laughs> you know? Uh, just And he's like, that, that, that's not that weird, is it? Are you crazy? That's genuinely, <laughs> profoundly nuts, dude. I mean, that is off the charts crazy stuff. Yeah, you know? it's, it's, yeah he could have just went, went and bought a little, little plot of ground in town and had his, had his porch swing in a real tree. But, I mean, I spent time on what I do in the book with uh, Jim Dickinson who, uh, and again, a brilliant producer. A um, lot of stuff out of Memphis. Uh, his kids are, are singers now. But um, he toured with the Rolling Stones. And um, at the end of the tour, a keyboard guy, at the end of the tour, they offered him a position in the Rolling Stones, which essentially that is if God dropped down and told you he was going to give you all the money on earth, right? I mean, it's the Rolling Stones at the peak of their power. And he goes, no, I turned him down. I said, why? He goes, not what I do. So uh, I always thought that was cool, you know. He did a great album called Be Beale Street Saturday Night. Um, just one it's a spectacular album. But uh, anyhow, I love those guys. You know, I loved hanging around Nashville. It was fun. What I like about the, the stories that you're telling is if, and it's, it's in a way it's almost frightening because if what I mean by that is, People don't ask them and then retell them. They're lost forever. They are. You know, it's, and that's like, that's one reason I enjoy what I do so much is just being able to hear those stories. I, I'll, my, my father-in-law, I'll sit with him. I was with him the other day. I'll tell you a quick story from my father-in-law. His dad was a pipe fitter. And like these stories, my wife was like, I never heard this story. And I said, well, you probably never asked your dad to tell you any stories. So my father-in-law's father was a pipe fitter at the University of Chicago during the 20s and 30s. So that's where the first real nuclear test started taking place. So my father-in-law had a summer job when they built the reactor at the University of Chicago, which was the makings of the Manhattan Project. And he would go down with a group of other kids into the tunnel that was the reactor and they'd sweep up every night after the <laughs> construction workers were done. And this was a lead line tunnel. So these are a bunch of kids down there, teenagers, smoking cigs. <laughs> I, this is the way I imagined it as, we're t as he's telling me the story. And he, uh, he took home a lead brick. So he virtually stole it from you know, the Manhattan Project and, and 
my brother-in-law has this brick to this day and nobody knew what it was. It was this big hunk of lead, but it was the, from the lead line tunnel of where they smashed the first atoms in history. And so like you listen to these stories and I think, you know, how, what a shame that we don't listen and tell these stories more. I think that's really what's like missing in our culture now is it's, there's no way to ahead. tell them. There's no way to tell them. I mean, um, who listens? Um, me and Cecil Birch were talking like a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was asking me which music was such and such and da da da. What really, you know? And I said, well, he goes, which song really convinced you that this is something that you wanted to be involved in? And I'm like, you're going to be surprised. And I said, off, uh, you know, John Sebastian, off, off Tarzana Kid, uh, what, 1968. And I said, uh, I mean, that was a great song. It had Dixie Chicken on it with Lowell George singing along. I mean, great album. But the song on it was Stories We Can Tell, a song John Sebastian wrote, I believe. And um, uh, that, that song, that's what, there's a great verse. It's like uh, staring at that guitar in some museum in Tennessee. Nameplate on, on the glass brings back 40 melodies. Scars on the bass shows of all the times he fell, singing about the stories he could tell. And I, I listened to that song a million times, and I, I realized that, that I wanted to go on the road. I mean, I wanted to do that. And I, I understood that, that stories are the currency of the road. Story, I think I said on Facebook, stories are how you pay your way on the road. You have stories. And, and you travel, and, you know, you were different people, and, you know, you're running down here every night, as the lyrics of the song says. And, you know, you go around the world, and, and in the end, it's the stories. And, and it's the currency that you offer up. I mean, um, and it doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter if it's me and Cecil Birch bullshitting in, in St. Louis over a drink or I'm around a campfire in Africa. There's always the stories. Um, and and I, I truly see them as currency. I, I truly see that, that if you're a storyteller, as I am, as you are, that's how we pay our way. You know, that is our obligation, that, that we tell stories. And we hope that that after we're gone, somebody picks up on that and says, damn, maybe I should repeat some stories. And more importantly, make your own stories. I mean, I, I once spoke to a big writer's conference, and I got up there and I said, you know, you know same thing you did. You know, when you introduce your friend? I had a person who was introducing me, and I give her the, you know, the CV and the little intro, the two-minute intro. And she starts into it, and then she puts it down, and she goes, Dear God, I would kill to have this man's resume. Dear God. And I said, well, that's, a, that's a hell of an interest. I got up and said, wow, okay, how do you follow that? Thank you. Later, buy my right. books. Uh, <laughs> but I said, I, I said to all the guys, I said, you, you guys can all have it. You know, there's nothing I did that you can't have. And they're like, well, how does that work? I said, give up everything you think that's secure. Walk away from it. You know, that's the deal. You can have what I have, but you can't be secure. You know, you can't say, you know, I've always figured I'd finish my life eating cat food, out, you know, living in a box under, under the interstate. Um, you can have security or you can have the road, but you can't have both. And, and um, I told them, I said, you guys are writers. You guys are writers. I said, you know what you have to do before you write? And everybody's like, I don't know what. I said, do. <laughs> you know, you have to do first. Yeah, you've got to live. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to write about? Cats? Really? Nobody wants to hear about your cats. You except the Japanese, and then, then your cat gets rich off the royalties from YouTube. But, uh, I mean, who knew? But anyway, um, and you'll, you can tell from this that I will blather endlessly. <laughs> I was about to ask you. You're not blathering at all. I was about to ask you, and you may have just said it. Sometimes I'll ask folks when it feels right. So on the context of what we're talking about, from time to time, we have a chance to communicate with people maybe but once, right? And, and for some people that'll listen, this may be the only time they ever hear you talk or read, or read your stuff. If you get one thing to pass on to people, it doesn't have to be some deeply meaningful thing or it could be the most meaningful thing in the world to you. What, what would that be? Uh, the same advice given to me. See clearly. See clearly. Look at the world around you and see it clearly. You know, not through, not through your paradigms, you know, not through, not through rose-colored glasses or blue glasses or beer glasses or any of those things. Mr. Ann was right. See clearly. 
And, and, and when you see clearly around you, I mean, what you see is nothing but open doors. And then it's just a matter of picking one of those doors and walking through it. How, how does a, especially a younger person, how do we take off the glasses? How do folks, you know, so many people I think are disillusioned. They assume they're seeing what is. What is the impetus? What is this thing that people need to do to be able to, to see what is? I think first, and, and I'm stealing some of this from a, a consultant named Joel Arthur Barker, whom I worked with in one of my lives. Uh, he wrote the book Paradigms, um, and he reintroduced, he and I reintroduced the word paradigms back into the language, me and one other consultant. We're sorry, it was a mistake. But he, Joel always told me that the first thing was being aware that you were not seeing clearly. The first thing is to say, I, what don't I see? Joel had this question. I mean, it was like, I thought it was a cool question. He said, um, when he was consulting with business, he said, uh, what, if, what, what, would, what would, if it's now totally impossible, but if you could do it, what would completely change your life? But let's not argue whether it's possible or possible. Let's table that argument. It's impossible. Fine. What would change your life? You're like, ah, oh, you know, free yourself from those fetters. But, I mean, you, you can't get past a paradigm. You can't get past blinders unless you accept that you have blinders. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes I have to step myself back because I'm, you know, I'm conservative. You know, I am an adamant advocate for the Second Amendment. And that is a set of blinders that, that, that in a sense, blinds me to certain other aspects. Yeah. And I, you're required to say, you know what? What if I'm wrong? What am I not seeing? And that, I mean, to me, that's a powerful, and I've heard that from like some special forces friends of mine, you know, and when, when they're out there, you know, trying to figure out what's, what's in the weeds. <laughs> what do I not see? Um, and at first it sounds like that Zen question, you know, one hand clapping. But if you, if you just get in the habit of saying that, remember, I mean, we program ourselves. Um, I went through a long stretch with uh, neuro-linguistic programming. Somebody hired me to, to launch a self-esteem magazine. And they said, what do you know about self-esteem? I said, until <laughs> you said that, nothing. I, I imagine a factory where they make happy faces, you know. <laughs> but um, I, I had to go to all these seminars, and a lot of them were really bullshit. Um, but uh, within bullshit, yeah, you know, there's a nugget in there. Yeah. You know, there's there. You know, first you listen to this guy, and you go, "This guy's so full of shit," and then he inadvertently says something. Like, I'm going to so steal that. Um, but uh, you know, I, I what I realized out of that was we, you know, we are constantly programming our own computer, constantly. Yeah. You know, with our inner talk and the things that we say. So why don't we program it to say, "Hey, you know, look around." Uh, and I, I tell people, when we talk about awareness and avoidance, awareness is not bad. They're like, well, that's paranoid, man. You're looking around, your head's on a swivel. No, man, the world's a cool place. There's a lot of things to see that if you're, if you're in your phone here, you're walking down the street here, you're not going to see them. Um, so what you do is you look around. And, yeah, there might be some bad things. There might be some bad karma coming towards you. But at the same time, there's a lot of really neat shit. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of yeah. cool things, you know, and by raising your awareness, by saying, I, yeah, I, I do not want to spend my life in white. I mean, to borrow something from Colonel Cooper, I don't want to spend my life in white. Why would I do that? You know, there's neat stuff. And, and it, you know, when you, when you become aware of neat stuff, you're going like, ha, that's cool. I could do that, you know, and, and so see clearly, I mean, it's a self-defense mechanism. The more clearly you see the world, the, the farther up on the curve you are if bad things happen. But at the same time, see clearly means are there opportunities that, that, uh, that I could do? And I, I have a function. I, I used to teach this. Um, I did a little public speaking. Um, the, I, I always thought of this idea of tabling, which was a little bit like um, from Joel Barker, is that when I thought about doing something, I thought, oh, I'm going to do this. For example, shooting gallery. You know, I'm going to do a television show. Okay, it's, it's Friday night. I'm in L.A. I know jack shit about television. I know a lot about guns. Um, and I think, okay, clearly it's impossible for me to do a television show. That's laughably stupid. Okay, I'm going to table that. I accept it. 
I can't do that. That's nuts. Why don't I put that over here? It's the same with climbing Mount McKinley. It's the same with learning how to cave dive. It's the same with writing a book. Yeah. Well, of course, that's idiotic. I can't do this. So I'm going to put this over here on the table, and I'll deal with it later. But the, the trick is to say, okay, now, if I could do it, what would be the first thing I do? What's the step one? And then, oh, it. yeah, what's the step two? And the next thing you know, you're down the road, you know? What's that line, Bilbo Baggins? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. roads are dangerous things. You put your feet on them, you never know where they're going to end up. But, you know, <laughs> you don't step on them. But that's the way I, I, you know, I try to say, don't address the sanity or the lack of sanity of it or the possibility or the lack of I had a woman stand up at a seminar and she goes, let me tell you the five reasons I can't do what you do. I said, wait, wait, you don't have to tell me anything. You just told me everything I need to know right there. That's all. That's it. <laughs> you don't believe it. <laughs> you know, you don't believe in it. And if you don't believe it, you can't do it. Yeah. And she's like, that's it? You don't want to hear my reasons? Well, no. They're all the same. They're all the dog ate my homework. It's only one reason. Only one excuse. My dog ate my homework. Um, but that's the only what one I would that matters, tell right? Yeah. Why not just say that instead of saying, you know, I tripped and I scratched my knee. And I got, I got Ebola and I was in the hospital. Like now the dog ate my homework. When I actually had employees, I would tell them that I'll never fire you for making a decision. Never. Even if it's the dumbest decision in the world, I won't fire you for it because you made a decision. And I said, don't tell me why you couldn't do something. Just come in and say, you know, Michael, I didn't do it. And I say, why? And you say, the dog ate my homework. And we're cool. I like it. I dig it, actually. There's a lot. I, as I'm listening to you, I, there's uh, nothing I, I don't agree with. I think it's, it's a fantastic representation of what our nation can do for one of its citizens, your, your life, all the cool things that you've done. Uh, people talking earlier, we kind of brushed on like where the course of events go, this precipice of, of possible impending civil war. But I think when people listen to a story like yours, it, it can be, if people take some action, a way for them to say, I can live any way I want. I and mean, that's pretty well, cool to me. That, that's the, t the totality of what our union was all about. A dude can be a music writer, a TV show producer and host, uh, uh, hang out and probably do drugs with Willie Nelson kind of a guy. Could have happened. Say it, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Statue of limitations has run out. I'm clean. Yeah, here. for sure. I think it's. I think it's fantastic. It's we we have gotten so linear in our approach to life that it's it's. I just need to go work long enough at this job that one day, hopefully, I'm healthy enough to leave and re retire and have a few years where I can still be mobile and maybe play a few games of golf and see the grandkids. Yeah. Peter do that. Out. Do that. And, uh, and uh, maybe I'll close with, I mean, you know, Hank Williams Jr., my buddy Hank Williams, and, and uh, Dickie Betts from the Allman Brothers. Here. Oh, yeah. He's a great guy that he just can't get past the heroin, man. But they wrote a song together called, you know, the Country State of Mind. And kind of the last bridge chorus is it, if the sun don't come up tomorrow, people, I have had a good time. <laughs> and I, I thought, that. That's I it. That. <laughs> I like it. Mike, I appreciate you taking the time. Mike and Michael. Does Mike, Mike work or not? Michael, done. Michael's as good as any. That's okay. my byline. I'm a Michael as well, but everybody calls me Mickey. Everybody calls yep. me Bane. I mean, I think my it's because of Batman. wife's mother, when she first met me, she said to me, you know, I've never met a Michael that wasn't a bad person. That was how, <laughs> my first introduction. And she's right. <laughs> and I started running through my head. Everybody I know. Yeah. I mean, she didn't mean like evil, but just, you know, got in trouble. <laughs> I'm going to remember that. <laughs> it's true, though. Think about it. If you start thinking, you're like, you're like, you could think of a Brian or a Tim or a Bob, and you're like, oh, that's a pretty good dude. But every Mike I knew got himself in some kind of shit. It's true. <laughs> Hey, folks, That's a good note to close on. It is. If you guys have not uh, seen Shooting Gallery or The Best Offense or uh, the 20 other things that Michael's done in his life, just Google Michael Bain. You'll see the, the uh, literary works, and you'll definitely see the stuff that's on TV. Uh, you're still out there making it happen every day. You've brought so many people uh, 
to the masses that folks wouldn't know other than like, you know, sometimes I think in our little world, like in the shooting world, people are quote unquote celebrities, but outside of that, nobody knows. I don't want to name names because I don't want to be insulting, but a guy that might be like a great shooter, nobody knows who the that guy is outside of the, the shooting world. But you brought those people and their skills to anybody that had cable television, which is freaking cool. So let let Mike's life be a lesson to you. If you dug this podcast, share it. Mike's got uh, probably one of the most well-known podcasts in this genre. What's the name of it, Mike? Downrange Radio. Downrange Radio. And people can find that on probably uh, just everywhere. By yeah, everywhere is what I was going to say. You guys, remember to uh, tell somebody you love them. Don't be a dickhead and live your life on your terms. I think that's a good way to end it. Be well. Absolutely. And, and thank you for having me, Michael. <laughs> that's, a, that's a kind of a dickhead move, bro. Kind of a dickhead move. Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at kerrytrainer.com or kerrytrainer.com.